Thank you for joining us as we journey through the great book of Exodus. And thank you very much to the DW Plus crew for having the vision and generosity of spirit to make this Exodus seminar produced at no small cost and substantial risk, freely available to all who are interested on YouTube. Perhaps you might consider a Daily Wire Plus subscription. It's a bastion of free speech. And we have great content there with much more to come. We journeyed to Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem to film a four-part documentary series on Western civilization and have additionally recorded specials on marriage, vision, the pitfalls and opportunities for adventure and masculinity, all of which are exclusively available there. These join many of the Beyond Order public lectures that made up my recent tour and my extensive back catalog, fully uncensored. Onward and upward. Hello everyone. We're on day three of this Exodus seminar, brought together a number of scholars from around the world and under the auspices of the production team of Daily Wire Plus. And thank you to them and thank you once again for all of you for coming. I'll just introduce everyone. Um, Douglas Headley, Oz Guinness, James Orr, Greg Hurwitz, a new arrival from yesterday, Dennis Prager, Stephen Blackwood, Jonathan Paggio. So we stopped yesterday at the end of Exodus 3, and I'm just going to reprise that. I was talking with Jonathan and James about the end of Exodus 3, and there's some uh, details there. They're not details. There's some important issues that we have to pick up. So I'll just read the last four verses of chapter 3, and then I'll defer to Jonathan. God says to Moses, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, referring to the tyranny, unto the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So, land that's already occupied, which we'll get to later, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. That's the paradisal vision for hungry people. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and, and ye shall say unto him, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you will not go empty. But every woman, it's every Jewish woman, shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. So over to you, Jonathan. You talked about the importance of that motif. I think it's very important, at least to understand it narratively, because this, I think, is an answer to the big discussion we had about asking the, the women to kill their children. There is a sense in which the Pharaoh wants to reduce the Israelites to potential that he can rule over. And then what we see now is a kind of a flip, okay, an inversion, where in fact, Egypt will now become that which will provide potential to Israel as it leaves. And it, and it puts things in the right order, at least narratively in the scripture, it puts it in the right order because this is difficult for some people to understand that Egypt is a, is a son of Ham. Egypt is a, is a son of the curse. He's an outsider, you would say. He's one of those that has been ejected, like Cain, ejected from the world and acts in a way as a kind of strange stranger, but also potential in which we can increase ourselves. And this is where you see that actually happening. And some of the church fathers, they, they explicitly talk about this as being the manner in which Christians or believers can incorporate things from strange lands, that can incorporate Greek, Greek uh, thinking or even some poetry from other cultures or from your own, our own ancient culture, that you can spoil the Egyptians, that they it is possible to to bring some things in if it's riches, done to riches, bring riches to bring in riches in from, in from the past and from other cultures as long as it's done in the proper 
in the proper order, that he doesn't... So so would it be in some sense, because God in this story is the spirit that's calling the Israelites to freedom, that if you bring in the treasures in the service of the proper good, then that becomes acceptable. And then James, over Mm. to you, because... Well, this is really just a footnote to what Jonathan's put so so beautifully just just now. Um, This motif of despoiling the Egyptians, stealing from the Egyptians, if we first see it in, I think, Origin of Alexandria, this is the just end of the second century, uh, third century. Augustine uses the idea as well. He probably probably wasn't aware of, of Origin. It becomes what is actually quite a challenging verse, this sort of instruction to, 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 to steal, particularly in light of the Ten Commandments coming further along. Exactly right. It's, 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 it's a troubling, troubling verse, but it becomes a really central idea, this, this claim that, that, as Douglas was talking about yesterday, that you can, that, that your license to explore pagan philosophy and to take p- pagan ideas, to, to sift through these ideas, as uh, 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 Abrahamic monotheism was so good at drawing in Hellenic ideas without being overwhelmed by them. Uh, and we can see, even we talked about yesterday, Exodus 3.14, this, this very pregnant philosophical metaphysical idea that I am, I am that I am, God, God's being and his existence, uh, his essence and his existence coming together in, in one. Augustine says, it's obvious that Plato must have read the books of the books of Moses when he's writing about uh, the, the, the myth of the cave and he's writing about objective transcendent reality and so on. And this becomes a really important idea, particularly in the second half of the first millennium, as we move into late antiquity after the collapse of Rome, you have the emergence of um, the monasteries, particularly on Benedict in 529 onwards, the founding of the famous um, um, monastery, uh, Monte, um, Monte Cassino, and there, the idea is that you know the, the monks preserve not just Christian scriptures and Christian texts, but also pagan ones as well. So in many ways, it's this idea that it's okay to take uh, pagan wisdom and to preserve it and to, and to cherish it, to nurture it, that that that, that this sort of verse licenses and, 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 it, and justifies. I, think, I just want to say one more thing. It's important because we might think of this as just an allegorical flurry, that this is just some kind of thing you put into the text. But we have to notice that. We're ju- we're very soon, that gold that the Egyptians have given the Israelites will be used to first make the golden calf and then later used to make the ornaments of the tabernacle. And so you can see exactly the potential that is taken from Egypt is now shown to be either corrupting, if it's in the wrong order, to make the idols of the pagan idols, or then ultimately in service of God in order to make the ornaments of the tabernacle. So just two quick observations on that. One of them is, I'm struck again and again by the revolutionary role of women constantly through Exodus. Like the women keep saving the day, right? Whether it's the midwives, whether it's the Pharaoh's daughter or here, like why would these women be the ones who are charged with going into the households and doing it? And so, well, one of the best predictors of economic development in the developing world is the freedom and rights associated with women. And there's a mythological uh, similarity between women and that the foreign in some sense. And so what you might say is that to the degree that a society is capable of, the patriarchs in a society are capable of attending to and valuing their own women who are other, they're capable of valuing the other as That's such. Right. And, so, it's, and it, it speaks to security, mm. right? To the, the, the lack of need to control women right. speaks to masculine security is right. one aspect. But the other thing that struck me is, is that the empathy here because empathy is an argument that is that let's say it's that it's ascendant in certain ways in the contemporary culture that might feel like in ways that are slightly corrupted, but empathy used to true end can lead to change in evolution and revolutionary thinking and revolution, and that comes in through them. And the strength of the women here is really remarkable because they do a whole bunch of things for no reason that kind of makes any sense politically, based on the basis of that like the great feminine power. The other thing I was going to say about the gold, you're talking about, Jonathan, the ways that the gold is appropriated. You know, nobody ever says where they get their weapons when they finally have the weapons. And so it's like, I think that, that it's either two options if I'm, if I'm looking at this as a thriller writer. I mean, one of it is that this gold and silver is forged into weapons mm-hmm. that is taken from here. You know, or maybe they pulled it off the washed up bodies of the Egyptians, yes. Egyptians. right? But there's it's the same idea, like yeah. right? So, so either way, it's appropriated, yeah. right? It's forged into not just the the, the messaging and the tabernacle of God, but also the forcefulness has to come in some ways from materials from the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. 
There's another side to this, I think, is let's call it psychological. In a certain sense, I think what these first three chapters have done for us is really sort of set out the whole drama of the human soul, like the whole the whole drama of the spiritual life. And you start in oppression and alienation, um, unable to get out of it yourself, longing for resolution, for homecoming, for the, for the promised land, and you can't get there. And so in a way, I think the story, this Exodus is of course precisely about God's work in moving us from, uh, from, from exile and from oppression to, to, to homecoming and, and resolution and nourishment. Um, but I think there's a, there's a side to this that is present in the, the spoiling of the Egyptians that's also psychological. And that is within that, that drama of, of, of redemption, or let's say, or salvation, there's, you know, it's not, it's not like, salvation could be real, true salvation if we forgot about everything we were before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if somehow our sins and our sufferings, our toils and tribulations that define us as, as the, this day today, who I am and have been, and we all carry these things with us, certainly I am today and any day, if those are somehow not part of where you end up in your resolution, then it's not you that is saved. And so there's a sense in which I think this is at least metaphorically, the, 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 the jewels of the Egyptians are a way of saying that this time of oppression and slavery will yet be turned into the promised land in well, a sense. Well, that's particularly relevant when you're trying to deal with something like the atrocious tyranny of the past. It's like, well, even if it's Egypt, and Egypt is all, oft, all, obviously cast as the tyrannical oppressor here, that doesn't mean there aren't there isn't the gold that you could use to build the proper uh, tabernacle, and there, and there are also the proper weapons that can still be derived from it, even if it's paste, painted as the tyranny itself. So, may I just make one <coughs> concluding remark about this uh, fascinating motif of spoiling the Egyptians, um, and that is in relation to the notion of Eurocentrism. Uh, which, of course, we hear a lot about and uh, many critiques of Eurocentrism. And yet, one of the striking aspects of European, let's say, Occidental culture, I'm thinking of North American culture as part of that Occidental world, of course, is, as a French philosopher recently has noted, is that it is eccentric. So this is a philosopher called Rémi Prague, and Rémi Prague has very powerfully argued that because our ancestors in Europe for centuries were using Latin, but Latin as a translation for sources either at the fringe of uh, Europe, Greece, or outside Europe, Hebrew. So that European culture was based on the sense that um, even though as a monk uh, in Monte Cassino or elsewhere, you might be using Latin, that the Latin is a translation and it's a translation of the Greek or it's a translation of the Hebrew. And he argues this is one reason why medievals took up Arabic so quickly, because once it became clear that Arabic was a way of actually getting to Greek, uh, more, more accurately. That was greeted with enthusiasm. So Bragg's idea is that unlike, say, the Indic tradition, where the, the Samskrita, the Sanskrit is the elegant tongue, it's the, that is the holy language, or even an Arabic, where, because of course, that's the language of, of, of the prophet. Um, European culture is, and European Western culture is, is based on this idea that its sources are without. Um, so that the very idea of an ethnocentric Occidental culture is um, a very problematic notion. And, and I think here this notion of the, the espousing, the spoiling of the Egyptian, the taking of the, the foreign and using it, uh, in a positive way, I think is, well, is very significant. Well, we could extend that too, to some degree, to the scientific endeavor. One of the things you commented on before we recorded today, James, was the fact that there's an insistence that God is a transcendent unity and not merely something that's tribal and that is lurking in some sense everywhere. And so that would be in the stranger and the foreigner. But it also means that God is in some real sense lurking 
in the material world and the natural object. And so just as you can look outside your culture for the treasure that the stranger and the foreigner might possess, mm -hmm. you can look outside your own material presuppositions for the transcendent knowledge that the natural world would hold. And that's actually, you know, there's a, there's a historical tradition that Christianity and and the scientific endeavor were at each other's throats, but it's a preposterous notion if you look into it more deeply. Underneath all that is the insistence that it's meet and good to encounter the natural world and to investigate it because it contains revelations as well. There's a reason Jung spent the second half of his career on alchemy, right? Or mm -hmm. was it his whole second half? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. And, and what's the phrase, I, I always forget the phrase that means the thing of greatest value. Instruculinus inventure. Yes. What you most need will be found where you least want to look. Mm. That's right. Right, right. Which is, well, that's, that's, a, that's a phrase that's, you can think about that in relationship to the crucifixion too, if you regard it as the, in some sense, as the symbol of the ultimate union of tragedy and malevolence. It's exactly there is the least place you want to look. And it's, it's the dragon that contains the gold or maybe the tyrant that that contains the treasure as well. Same well, way. The, is, that's like overcoming a giant too. Or the it's very common mythological The golden motif. resources of the Egyptian slave mm -hmm. holders. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly that. Well, exactly. One of the early cri criticisms of monotheism, in, in certainly by pagan philosophers, was that, that monotheism secularizes nature. That is to say, it rids nature of gods, of magic, if you've got a creationist framework, that is to say, you've got, you've got a framework in which all of reality is understood to be the outcome of a single, purposive, supremely rational, powerful being, then you don't need to explain earthquakes by appealing to Poseidon. There aren't going to be any more sort of nymphs in the forests, as it were. All of that gets, gets banished. This is a sort of common criticism. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly, I think it's 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 true that it also brings with it this idea that that nature is 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 legible. That is to say, all of nature is legible, right. and not animated, but legible because yeah. it deanimates it yeah. too. If you take God it, out of the equation, right. Right? It's in, it reflects the kind of a single creative blueprint of a single source of, of, of a single kind of cognitive uh, source of subjectivity, a unified consciousness. Um, I mean, you know, in Plato's heaven, you've got all of these different uh, things existing. You've got numbers, you've got propositions, you've got truths and forms and all this sort of thing. What, what Philo of Alexandria does in, in, in the first century and what Augustine does later in the fourth century is to, as it were, give a kind of change of metaphysical address, is where he says, we've got to sort of baptize Plato's heaven. We've got to move all of this, uh, all everything that's in Plato's heaven into the divine mind. And that makes a, that's a much more natural philosophical philosophical home for thoughts and propositions and numbers and so on and so forth. Let me offer a word on the spoiling of the Egyptians, uh, which I don't think you would have necessarily considered without the Hebrew. The Hebrew note, most of your translations say borrow. Is that correct? Uh, the King James and some others. It's funny. Yeah. So first of all, it, notice you, it doesn't say take. It really doesn't say borrow either, and this will fascinate you. The Hebrew is you will ask. Mm. I mean, and it's in modern Hebrew as well. This is not a difficult word. Sha'alta, she'ela, it means question, to ask. Number two, in light of your point about the women, I think that that adds to the point that I'm making. It's, uh, it's much less intimidating to have the women get the jewelry than the men. So, a, so in effect, what is happening is, oh, so the women will ask for, for valuables is not the same as men will take. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to note that because I think, I think it's relevant to what the text wants to say. Isn't there another point, Dennis, too, that the rabbis say that later when indentured servants are freed, the master gives them something as that's, they go out. That, that's right. And this is the Lord's doing it for his people yeah. as they leave slavery. And by the way, on your point about the desacralizing nature, all of the plagues except for the 10th are against nature gods of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Are you looking to dive deeper into the entire Bible? Look no further than the Hallow app the number one prayer app in the world featuring an entire category of content to help you dive deeper into prayer and meditation on the Bible. 
By studying the Bible, you'll gain a deeper appreciation for the power of storytelling, symbolism, and metaphor, enriching your understanding of literature across different genres. Go through the Bible in a year with Father Mike Schmitz, or hear the Bible narrated by renowned actors like Jonathan Rumi from The Chosen or Jim Caviezel from Sound of Freedom. Hallow has over 10,000 audio-guided prayers, meditations, and music to deepen your understanding and knowledge of the Bible. The Hallow app also helps you connect with a community of like-minded individuals, sharing experiences, insights, and encouragement along your path to spiritual growth. Enrich your education and nurture your mind and soul today. Download the Hallow app at hallow.com slash exodus20 for 20% off your annual subscription. That's hallow.com slash exodus20. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod, a staff, a walking stick, a pole. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And Moses cast it on the ground, and it, it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And Moses put forth his hand and caught it, and it once again became a rod in his hand. Well, well we, there's a lot packed into that, that's for sure. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments and then it'll open up. The staff of Moses and the staff of Aaron, that, that idea just never goes away after this introduction in the text. And so a staff is something, if you have a staff and you're the owner of a company, the staff does your will, you rely on the staff as well. And so, and that meaning is a derivation from this same root idea. If you're walking, when you walk with a walking stick, then you can lean on the stick. And so while you're on the way, you have something to lean on. And so the rod is also a symbol of solidity and stability and tradition. And then the rod, the staff, the tradition can turn into a snake. And that means that what's solid and reliable and that you can use on your way can also transform itself suddenly into chaos. So there's yin-yang dichotomy there that emerges. And then after all that, and that's terrifying because when your tradition falls apart and the chaotic serpents emerge instead, then that's terrifying and that's what happens to Moses. But then God tells him, take the serpent by the tail, which by the way is the most dangerous way to grab a serpent because you grab them by the head. And so if you have enough courage to grasp what's dangerous, then you will become credible enough to be listened to. And that's part of the understructure narrative that drives this in some sense, this magic trick. And then we see the motif of being exposed to the serpent as a curative process replicated through itself through the text. And we also know that the symbol that even modern physicians use to, to symbolize their healing power is the symbol of the rod and the staff, which I believe in that case is of Greek origin. Which, yeah. Right, Asclepius. But there's a parallel there that's, ob that's there's obviously definitely not. a parallel. There's yeah, a yeah. Well, the parallel. Well, and is that historical replication? Is it archetypal replication? I think it's or is archetypal. It, derivation it from has the to same be, source. Has to be archetypal. Uh, we'll see it more when we get to the to the to the serpent on the staff mm -hmm. itself. That story. We can maybe talk about it then. But it's definitely <clears throat> it's definitely a universal story. But it's also it's also referring to the serpent and the tree. You yeah. know, in terms of uh, it's it's a, it's interesting because for Moses, as we're thinking about him as the emergent hero, and we're talking yesterday a lot about the fact that he he his ability to engage transformationally is one of the things that's mm -hmm. defining his ability to see and hear God is what what illuminates God to him, though God's already independent in Genesis, as we discuss. But the ability to transform the snake, right, into a staff again is the transformational ability that means it's caused to lead, right? It's, it's, that, it's Well, that's the definition chaos. of the hero. The hero does right. both. He casts order into chaos and chaos into order. He's a mediating yep. factor between the two. That's right. So it's, I always think with the yin and yang, every, people forget the eyeballs. And the eyeballs for me are like Colossus of Rhodes, <laughs> astride right, astride the line. That's where you want to stand. And so it's good from evil per the tree, the Garden of Eden, but it's also chaos to order. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, I think chaos to order is actually a better way to under to understand it. It's mm -hmm. the it's the, the rod to that which is flexible, right? A snake is a, that's why it also says grab by the tail. It's one making you want to understand that it's a tail. It's something that moves and is flexible, isn't solid like a like a staff. But you can understand it in terms of attention because that's actually how mm -hmm. attention works. It's like you have something undefined. What do you do? You mentally or physically grasp it, and when that you, isn't what understand that's, means. That's exactly when you, PSA pointed that out yeah. when he talked about children building their, uh, what, do you, what do you call those, psychomotor schema to begin with. So the basic pre-conceptions pre of perception itself are the gripping element. And so when children are trying to figure out how to see something and therefore how to conceptualize and perceive it, they have, that's why they, people say sometimes, look with your eyes and not with your hands, right? They'll say that to their little kids, but their little kids are literally <clears throat> gripping the chaos of the world so that they can transform it into something stable and reliable so it's worth making the obvious point that you know the, the both the rod and the snake are symbols of sovereign pharaonic authority the the the, the pharaohs would have had a snake in the, their headdress uh, i think the, the, yeah. the, the, the even more than that not only the snake but the, the pharaohs have a rod and a fly a fly swat and so the fly swat is also that tail and so it is a rod and a tail. Those so the symbolism the is that, that Moses is being invested with a kind of counter authority, a kind of he's be becoming the leader of, of, of anti Egypt. Right. So you have to be the yeah. master of the staff and the snake right. in order yeah. to lead. Yeah. Well, that's the snake that eats all the other snakes. Right, right, right. So he, that's a, a representation of his ability to. So and that's so interesting that it's the snake, right? So he's the master of the chaos that eats all other chaos. Yeah, but it doesn't the possibility say possibility that swallows it's the rod the that eats the snakes. It's a, when we get to it, you'll see. We think that it's the snakes, but in my memory, it's that it says that that uh, Moses's rod ate the snakes of the. Oh, of oh the, it's Moses's yeah. rod. Yeah, because that's that's how it works, right? It's the order that right. actually that contains. It's, it's it's actually like grasping the tail. The the rod is going to consume the. So it's the a snake. superordinate order that can consume all chaos. Yeah, and that's what Moses is standing for. Yeah, he has and that's best. why he's an agent yeah. of the highest authority. But you can see it as the law itself. Like this is this is it's the it's the the law and the the the, the transgressions. And so it's like it one moves. It you know he's able to master, like you said, grab it and it. And it comes back, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also the shepherd's staff, I guess. The, the, mm -hmm. You know, he, the, 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 the sort of imagery of him becoming the, the shepherd of his people, mm -hmm. and so the, the rod becomes the the, the, the you shepherd's crook. Chasing away the shepherds, even absolutely, with his rod. Yeah, he that's takes right. Away the shepherds and, and, and defeating the pharaohs. What does a shepherd use a rod for? Well, I mean, a shepherd's crook, I guess, yeah. a staff. Right, uh, and well, it's, to, to, it's to it's to rein in the sheep. Is that also part of it? That's and right. To fight off lions. To rescue the sheep. To rescue the sheep. To rescue the sheep. To yeah, to lead the sheep to round them up. Uh, yeah. Well, we should remember that when you were a shepherd in that time, that was actually a real man's job because there were lions and they liked to eat sheep. And so part of being a shepherd was like fighting off lions. And so, are you implying that contemporary shepherds aren't sufficiently No, manly? I definitely okay. I wouldn't dare to do that. Because we, we have some contemporary shepherds we didn't have a conversation with you, doctor. By the way, the, uh, the order chaos thing is, uh, is so, uh, I'm glad you raised it. And I had not thought of it, frankly, in, in these terms. But it's, it's for, my, for me, a, the central teaching of Genesis. Mm. I always tell people, I think Genesis 1-1 one, one is the most important verse in the Bible, but I think 1-2 is the second most important. Everything was chaos. Mm. And what God does for six days is make order out of chaos. So, and, and we, are, we are living in the post-God era, and we are living in a chaotic era. And I hope I'm not too contemporary by noting that men menstruate is a statement of chaos. Mm -hmm. right. we, so again, the the centrality of, of the significance of God. It, it, well, that's an anti-Rod movement because Derrida himself said that his deconstructionism was aimed at phallocentricism. It was phallogocentricism, but that, 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 that degeneration of those categories, especially with regard to male and female, that's not an accidental consequence no, of all. the system of ideas. That's a central target of, of what right. we use called the, focal the, attack. And it is an attack on the rod, fundamentally. So... I no, no, I, 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 I just... Forgive me, I just want to make one other macro point, because that's how my mind thinks. Uh, I, in my, uh, long, many decades of, of radio and speaking and so on, I have not made, the as much as I believe in God, I truly do, 
I have never found that arguments for God's existence are nearly as effective or as important as arguments for God's necessity. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, that's the point that, mm -hmm. that I want to make here and we're all making here. No God, chaos. You don't believe in God, at least understand what the consequences oh, right, of right, that right. non-belief well, are. What's so interesting, you, go ahead, Greg. Uh, what's interesting about that is we keep having these conversations, and the more, I, the more that I've been thinking about this in relation to my you know, forays into the political or cultural world, this is another consequence of how you align the moral with the strategic. And in some ways, what you're saying is, is if you make a moral argument, people don't even know why they think what they think. Mm -hmm. So to come in and say to them, you need to change your moral outlook, right? What you're suggesting is, and why I think that's more fruitful is it's a strategic approach and that's a way to lead people in and then they can decide how high up that hierarchy mm -hmm. of understanding they want yeah. to move. Well, you can, you can look at this purely psychologically, which I like to do as much as possible because uh, I don't think you should bring God into the issue unless you have to in some sense. Um, you either are aiming for something unified, which means something at the pinnacle and something that's the highest and superordinate and most valuable, or you're not, in which case perhaps you're aiming down, or you're aiming at a multiplicity of diverse things which are conflictual. Those are your options. And we know that if your perception is fragmented and if your navigation is fragmented, which is a chaotic state, the consequence of that is anxiety and despair, because that's actually what anxiety and despair mark, is that you're, you're confident and secure when, you're, when you've reduced your plethora of potential pathways forward to one path. You know that if you're in a vehicle, it's like, well, are you going one place or 10? If you're going 10, you can't go anywhere and you're confused. You have to be going one place and then everything snaps together and then your nervous system is literally regulated. Anxiety is the response to chaos, the a priori response I mean, to can chaos. I mean, can I ask Dennis a question in light of that? So, Dennis, you said earlier that, <clears throat> you, that you need the necessity of God is, is the necessity of belief in God is, is, is what's going to restore us, what's going to keep civilization on the right track. But is that, uh, is it enough to have a kind of psychological, just a, a psychological sort of stability, a belief that God uh, might exist or that you should, you should conduct yourself as if uh, God, God is real, God exists, it's just as a kind of something that, that provides you with a kind of uh, psychological unity and, and stability and order? Or do you think that it's, do you think that a, the, that a culture needs more than that? Is, is, is a kind of cultural, cultural religion, cultural Judaism, cultural Christianity, enough well mine's not cultural i'm not as nice as cultural is uh but you I, seem to leave open that possibility yes, mm -hmm. it's a i wrestle with that and i have come down to the i've come to the conclusion that i offered earlier the number of people who believe in god and that god is meaningless is enormous for most moderns god is a celestial butler uh, this God here is my list of what I'd like you to do for me. Have a great day. I am, I am uninterested. For, I know this is almost heretical for many of my religious friends. Uh, I have asked God in my whole life twice for something. Once that my mother not punish me for breaking the vase in the house. And then once as, as an adult. By the way, in both instances, they were answered. It's a little eerie for me who doesn't ask him for anything. But, it, but in all seriousness, I am infinitely more interested in what God wants from me than what I want from God. And that's, that's the way I portray it to, to people. And they're moved by that because they know God is not a celestial butler. The number of, of people who prayed for their dying child and the child died, everybody knows that that's the case. So uh, I, I, I am, I hate to use the term, I'm a, I was gonna say tired. Okay, I'm tired of people who say they believe in God, but it doesn't amount to anything. Why is God important? Changes minds. That, and, and you know, the, the founders of America, which I think is the greatest country ever founded, and, and, it may, and it may fall over 
uh, were at a crisis point. They knew the importance. They were not all doctrinaire Christians. They were all, by the way, cultural Christians, clearly. Uh, but they were all very God-centered. Uh, when Benjamin Franklin is considered a deist, the, 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 if deist means Aristotle's unmoved mover, none of the founders were deists. They believed in a God who acted in history. Jefferson, this is almost unknown to Americans. Jefferson and Franklin designed a great seal of the United States. You'll find this fascinating. You know what it is? The Jews leaving Egypt. It was not, tragically, it was not adopted. Two of the least... Uh, Orthodox Christians, small o, uh, uh, were uh, wanted the, a biblical depiction to depict America. The, the Hebrews left is, uh, Egypt, we left Europe. Th that, so they knew the importance of God, and, and uh, a lot of believers don't. And so I just, I'm sorry for talking so long, but... John, can I... Thank you. Can I pick up on yes, what do. Dennis is saying? Another aspect of the American Revolution. You probably know that at the um, defeat of George uh, Yorktown, the Hessian and British troops were ordered to play the ballad, the world turned upside down, which was a 17th century ballad and came out of the English Revolution which came out of the Torah. And the simple idea was, it became various crazy things with the diggers and the levelers and so on. God had created order. Humans had created disorder. So God, to create order again, turned the world the right way up and turned it upside down. And you have in Acts 17, these men who've turned the world upside down have come here. And so on. So, and the original idea of revolution was actually biblical, although today it's almost totally to taken over the by chaos. the left, reordering the world and putting it the right way up. Or again, you just say repairing, That's a revolution. repairing the earth. Yes, repair, repairing the world under the rule of God. Yeah. yeah. So we we could say that you could ask the question not so much what do you have with God, you could reverse it in the Nietzschean sense. You could say, what do you have without God? Mm -hmm. And then what you definitely have is you have no centralizing axis. You have no highest, you have no highest spirit in the highest place. And so psychologically, that means chaos and confusion and internal conflict. And then you have no common spirit that unites you. And so then you have conflict. And so I would say that Acting as if is the crucial issue. And I was going over that this morning in a class I was doing on the Sermon on the Mount. And Christ says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, the ordering of his ethical injunction is something like do and then teach. But it's in that order. But it's not do only and it's not teach only. It's do and then teach. And so you could say you have this internal mimicry of the Father, the Holy Spirit, let's say, the revolutionary spirit in the proper sense. And then you can communicate descriptions of that spirit. And that's the religious enterprise. It, and we confuse that, I would say, in some sense, with descriptions of external reality. They're not the same thing. The religious enterprise is the description of the animating spirit and the proper animating spirit. And, and that's why even in the Exodus story, God is presented as the spirit that calls the hero to lead his people out of slavery. It's not a description of the world. It isn't that the idea that there's wisdom in the world isn't there, but that's not the superordinate idea. And so I think you need both. You have to have the acting as if. That's the primary thing, because otherwise you're a hypocrite. The, the most famous philosopher of the as if is Immanuel Kant of the 18th century. I mean, just a, a, the great kind of father of the Enlightenment. And he's often thought uh, to be somebody who who does away with God. He, he's a kind of precursor to Nietzsche in lots of ways. There was a, a poet called Heine who said that uh, Kant was much more devastating than Robespierre, because whereas Robespierre just uh, decapitated a, a, a king, Kant decapitated God. But I think hmm. he had this idea that you, you, we can't, we can't know that God's, God exists. We can't have theoretical knowledge that God exists, but we must so conduct ourselves in the ethical life as if God exists. Because as free beings, as, that's the primacy of pure practical reason. So, so we know its reality as free agents. So you could say in a way that Kant is not actually claiming that, I mean, 
I think Heine is completely wrong about this, but that, that, that it, you know, God is just a regulative as if, as of. But rather, he is criticizing a notion that, a sort of Aristotelian, Platonic notion, that our, you know, we can know God by contemplating some abstract object. And he's saying, no, we, we have contact. We have contact with noumenal reality. Right. We have contact with the divine as free agents. So when we obey the, the categorical imperative, which he thinks is intrinsically linked to the idea of God, that that's, that's the kind of knowledge. Oh. We, we you know, saw that echoed about. with Moses. I mean, Moses walks by the burning bush, but as we all noted, he does turn to notice. And so I would say we do have access to experience of God if, if we pay enough attention. And we pay it enough attention to the things that, in some sense, transcend our current parochial well, conceptualization. So, I mean, I think, he, you know, you're quite Kantian in, I think, your, your approach, Jordan, in the sense that you, you, you attend to the structures of subjectivity and the structures of, uh, the, the, that are uncovered by psychoanalysis and, and, and psychology. But you're also, I think, more, and th this is a development, I think, this is, I've not really heard you talk like this until quite recently, this notion of transcendence, not kind of divine transcendence, but somehow that the, the world beyond the world as, it is, as, it's, as it's given, morality as well, pierces through those, those, that kind of your kind of psychological wrapping. I think that that's a development in your thought. Uh, um, just going back to Jonathan's point, th there is this, what, what Kant is doing and what maybe you're doing as, uh, as well, Jordan, is separating out what you can say about God. So you, you're just, um, Kant says you kind of, we, we put, put God behind what we can really know, but we can still have faith in God. We can conduct ourselves as if God exists, but we can't know that God exists. So. I, I want to return to Dennis's point. I think it's such an important point. And first of all, with your track record on what you've asked God, I think you would get a little bit more uh, confident in future requests. Uh, I, um, I, well, actually, I think he, he, I got the requests as God's way of laughing at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, oh, so you never right. asked me for anything? Right. Just for that, I will deliver. Right, right. And, then and I also, go, oh, like, you really, you really want to burn one of your genie wishes on a vase? Well, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I was eight years old, all right? Hello, okay. But the point you made that I think is so important is you talked about that, that, that you ask, you basically, your relationship with God is asking for responsibility. Like, what, what is your responsibility? What does God want you to do? Right. And that, to me, is the That's solution. Prayer. Sorry? That's a better prayer. It's a better it's prayer, beautiful. but it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah, also yeah. the solution to when you're saying you're in a car and you need to know where you're going, right? We talk, you and I talk all the time about how right now we have an elevation of what people's rights are over what the responsibilities are, mm -hmm. right? If you're asking God for things, it's it's infinite what you might want. And, and, you know, thank God for unanswered prayers. There's a reason why that is a cliche that has entered not only the vernacular, but country music. Um, Right. And so part of this is, is it's, it's infinite if you're dictating your relationship with God based on things you might want. But with responsibility, if you're focused to ask what it is and how you should serve, that's what puts you in a car on a particular direction. Maybe that's also what m helps you know that God exists in some real sense. I mean, there's a, par there's a paradox in the notion of whether we can know God exists. And the paradox is in part, you can't know God. And so can you know that something exists that you can't understand? And the answer is, well, then maybe that's why you only see God's back in some real sense, right? You, you get hints and, and, and maybe you get hints if you open yourself up in the right way. And one of the ways you open yourself up in the right way is not to ask for what you want in the God is a celestial butler manner, but the, the, to ask how it is that you could transform yourself so that you could be a better agent of the divine will or something right. like that. And then that, what do you is, find when you do that? When you right, embrace right. responsibility, what you find is meaning. Yeah, well, that that seems to that seems well, to be well, the case. Well, especially if the responsibility you believe is divine, if, right. if it's if it's just purely human, I don't know how much meaning it gives. Well, probably but what I mean is in your approach. Yeah, my, approach that, that is my take. approach. Oh, it, right. it, it, uh, so uh, that is a that is a route to meaning, which is a route to the divine. Well, the secularists yes. would say, well, you without God, you could still find meaning in service to others, and I would say, yes, that's true, but. The reason you find meaning in the service to others is because that's one step on the ladder to the divine. Yeah. 
Have you ever heard of data brokers? They're the middlemen collecting your browsing history, online searches, and location data to build a digital profile of you. They make money by selling your profile to advertisers who use it to target you with their ads. The good news is, you can keep that information out of their hands with ExpressVPN. All of your devices have a unique IP address that apps and websites use to identify you. ExpressVPN hides your IP address so data brokers can't use it to track you. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your online traffic, so data brokers can't see what you're browsing, searching, or downloading. The best part is, you don't need to be a tech expert to use the ExpressVPN app. Just tap one button on your phone, tablet, or computer, and you're protected. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash Jordan. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Jordan and get three extra months free expressvpn.com slash Jordan. Well, the people who constructed the gulags, you know, there was a lot of altruism there. There was a lot of cooperation. There was a lot of, uh, <laughs> you know, there was, there was a horizon of, of, of action and, and, and there, was, there was planning and, and so on. By the way, the, 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 forgive me, I just want to say the issue of uh, the consequences of no God is a, very, is a very powerful impetus in my life to belief. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as odd as it sounds, I, I always tell people, I come to God through the back door, mm -hmm. not through the front door. The front door is God has appeared to you in some way or whatever, and I, and I never knock that for anyone who has that experience. I have not. To me, the most powerful rational argument is the consequences of the, of the death of the divine. When the chaos and, and indeed ultimately evil that ensues if I understand that without X, nothing exists, then X must exist. I hate, I'm, I'm not a physicist. I, I, I don't think in the algebraic terms, but that's how I think. The greatest argument for God is what happens without God. Uh, uh, it, well, if, it seems to be in some sense the most irrefutable argument. I would say I right, came to my right. belief the same way. It's like, well, Nietzsche said God is dead and what's going to happen? His prognostication was, oh, Nihilism and psychological catastrophe, and then mass murder on a scale unparalleled, but other than which that, was exactly right, which was exactly right. But Nietzsche would just call this wish fulfillment. He might say, well, maybe reality just doesn't like us very much. It doesn't. But also Exodus would have an answer to that. Like the, the, the view I think that this text is offering to us is there's nothing outside of God. I mean... There is no, is there God, is there not God? I mean, the, the, at least the account of this text, we can take it seriously, is that, I mean, this text here is that it's all within God. There's no, there's no well, outside that's part of, Well, that's part and, of the divine unity, the divine unity argument. And, and in, 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 a, in a sense, I think what's, 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 at least what the text is saying, I think, is that it's, this text is trying to help us have a revelation of what God is. Mm -hmm. That's what the you know the, the the Bible takes itself to be doing, and in this case, the statement that God is this transcendent principle, the source of all being, the 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 origin and you might say sovereign principle of all reality, I think is very fundamental here in relation to you know we can't simply say Moses goes and he does these things. I mean, the whole language of the text here, and I think the whole argument of Exodus, is that Moses has to bring himself into conformity with that transcendent principle, which is his source. And it's always described as, you know, he says right here in the beginning of the fourth, the fourth chapter, you know, they're not going to believe me. And he says, well, okay, let me tell you what to do. And it says this, this, this comes again and again and again. And God said to Moses, here's what I want you to do. So There's if you no abide sense. by God's word, then people will assume that you're a legitimate agent of God. And part, and part of that, to James's point about the gulags, which is a very fair point, is we tend to think of this orientation of meaning as being something that is an event. Like there's an epiphany and then it occurs. But when you have meaning and let's say you're in the car and you know where you're going, there's that also driving in that car and going where you're going has a high likelihood of ossifying into rigidity, right? There's one direction and you're on the path. And what's so interesting to me with this, with Mo, there's so many mistakes, right? Like God almost kills Moses later for some reason we don't even know. And then Aaron messes everything up and it's, it's, it's a constant process. And so faith rod, is snake, rod, snake, rod, right, snake. That's right. And so faith is, faith is a process and there's a sort of rigidity that happens immediately of, 
like I'm saved, I'm found, I have my meaning, I'm going somewhere. And it's like, well, be careful because every step of the way, right, the path that you're on so has it's to, be to be a humble path, right? Right. It's like I'm on a path and it looks good, but, but, but who am I to be so certain? So, yeah, well, I think you could make the gulag point even more, particularly with the Germans, because the Russians... They just weren't that good at it. I mean, they killed a lot of people, but compared to the Germans, they didn't have that unbelievably disciplined efficiency. And so, in some sense, what made the Nazi catastrophe so utterly horrifying is that what was the greatest in some real sense about Western civilization was subverted most effectively to evil. And that's a, in no small part, perhaps only in, only because the divine principle had fallen apart. And then it was replaced you, by you the said state, something for God's which, sake. Uh, with, uh, uh, we're all experiencing it with everybody. There's a gem thrown out and then another point. And you, but I, I just want to, you said something to the effect that um, how people behave or is their greatest argument for God or something. Did you recall just saying that? I know you said something analogous, but, uh, and uh, uh, it just triggered something that I, uh, I feel also very keenly. I, the the greatest argument for atheism is never given by atheists. It's given by bad religious people. Good religious people are the best argument for God's existence, mm -hmm. and bad religious people Look, are the best Dennis, argument all, for atheism. All the people who comment on my biblical lectures who are atheists who've come to appreciate Genesis, they almost all say the same thing. They said, I was so brutalized by bad religious people when I was a kid that it turned me against not only God, but religion. I have a Come prayer. May all bad religious people either become good or atheists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we don't know. We, we don't know how Dennis. much damage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wish. That's good. After that. There you go. All right. Hey, well, look, I'm batting two for two, as we say in America, too. Those of you right, that are, so I don't know. If... We've got through four whole verses so far. That they may believe that the Lord of God, that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, furthermore, unto Moses, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, like Napoleon. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous as snow. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, God says, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, the rod and the snakes, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And there's an an emphasis here on the healing capacity of divine alignment. It's something like that. And so the hero is the person who can speak the words of magic that are curative. And well, and we certainly Oz, believe that in the psychotherapeutic sense. So, Well, to Oz's point yesterday, believe the voice of the latter. It's the voice of the latter, even though it's visual. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's just a, I think it's also there to help you understand the first miracle. It's just two versions of the same miracle. You know, it's like moving from wholeness. So one is a vertical, a vertical to the watery chaos at the bottom, snake at the bottom, Leviathan, all that. And the other one is the periphery to the center. And so it's like move out, disease, move in, find healing. Mm. And so I think that that's what that's what it's it's showing. It's like this relationship of the center to the to the periphery, and the other one is a vertical to the to that which is at the bottom. And if it it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs. Neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. So there's more of his mastery of water there. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Am I not the Lord? It's actually, have I not the Lord? Now, therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. 
And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart, and thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And so now we have this building of an intermediary structure. Jonathan, you've maybe got some things to say about I mean, that. I think that uh, this is the, be the beginning of this idea of an, the importance of the intermediary structure, but not just importance, but also the manner in which God will fill the world is through something like that. And so it's really radical what he's actually saying. He's saying, he's like, I'm gonna set up a, a, a structure in which you're going to be God to Aaron and I'm going to be God to you. And so it's going to be like a, this, this, exactly this, this, this hierarchy of sub gods. And you will see this, that, so this is just the first example of it. But then as the text continues, there'll be all these different iterations of this intermediary structure, whether it is the structure of authority that, uh, that, that is, uh, that his wife's father is, is, is suggesting, and then whether it be the law itself, the law is these mediations. Jonathan, uh, why do you think that that first mediation or the first appointed sub-God has to do with him being, right, because it's just as easy for God to say, I will make thee speak clearly. Yeah. Why is the first choice somebody who speaks, who can speak from, is it that proximity to God requires a sort of inarticulateness, that the closeness to God means it can't be conveyed as clearly, and thus the need for... That's a really, I never thought well, about it could, that. It could, that's it could a, be, actually a very you know, interesting that, idea. Because Moses is someone who, by the nature of his experience, can, 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 can be inspired by God, but he can't translate it into language. Right. Wait a minute, if you speak articulately, you're not close to God? Well, I think it's... Well, yeah, I think it's a twist. Well, 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 light of that. But isn't there something very striking here that um, we're told that he, you know, he says, I'm not eloquent. And yet, um, you know, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, we read that, uh, and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom God knew face to face. Now, so this idea that Moses is the prophet par excellence, and yet we're told, he says, I, I, I'm not good with words. I mean, <laughs> well, it means you can be good without being able to think verbally. That's part of it. Well, clearly he grew. Well, there's yeah, the well, same face to too. face, of well, course. There's a That's narrative trope of yeah. like yeah. the blind prophet. Yeah. There's many narrative tropes like that where mm -hmm. you have someone who's deficient in the, the prophet who doesn't see, but actually sees spiritually. Mm -hmm. So it's like an, uh, this, this. And the need for the, tra the, need for the storytelling but here's the intermediary. Opposite, right? He sees God face, he says. I, mean, I just mentioned Deuteronomy. He says, sees him face to face, but he's, he's, he's a mumbler, he's a stumbler. I, I, I really appreciated the, the point that you made yesterday, Jonathan. I, I think that this idea that Moses is without logos, and I'm not sure how it's translated in the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the, what, the third century? BC of, 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 the, uh, of the Hebrew scriptures, that um, Moses is, is, so he's stumbling, he's without speech, but Logos, of course, he's, he's without reason. And as it were, he's the perfect vehicle for the divine Logos. That was what you were trying to say, I, I think, right? And he's being prepared just for, not just for divine revelation, but for the specific revelation in the Decalogue. And, it, and it's important to understand the mediation. The, the difficulty with mediation is that as you go down the mountain, as you come down, then there's the problem that things can start going off key right away, you know, because that's the problem of mediation. It's like on the one hand, it offers the identity down into the particulars, but also then it starts to get yeah. wonky. Sure. And so if Aaron, you're up on the mountain, someone so, might make a golden calf while they're down at the bottom. But that, yeah. That's exactly, but it's Aaron who makes the yep, golden that's calf. Right. It's the one that God yeah, establishes well, that, as, as the second as the tier of, too, of that's, well, right, so there's, that's right. There's, there's maybe, there's, a, there's, there's, okay, so what but we're, the, what the we mediation have is, is starting to, the danger of the mediation the is starting Luciferian to appear. The Luciferian intellect is supposed to be subordinate to the process that has the divine revelation. That's what it means. And that's so, what it means. And that's what Ian McGilchrist has said about how the brain should function properly, right? Is that the left hemisphere is the arrogant intellect in all, in, in, the, in the fundamental sense of the word. And it likes to think that what it knows is everything. And properly, it should be subordinate to the right, which is inarticulate, but which has, it, it has the ability yeah. to look up fundamentally. Well, so, so, so St. Gregor of Nyssa, who I've mentioned a few times in terms of his commentary on this, he goes exactly towards McGilchrist. I don't know if McGilchrist <laughs> is aware of him, but so he says that Aaron is the helper, and he presents him 
as the guardian angel. He says, Aaron is like the guardian angel. And each person, like in the cartoons, they have an angel on their right shoulder and a devil on their left shoulder. And both of those are something like their Aaron, the two possibilities of Aaron. So it's like a, an influence which can pull you in one direction or the other. And you have to be able to see the good helper and be mm -hmm. careful of the day well, of the well, bad helper. You know, if you're orienting yourself properly in the world, I would say in relationship to your own intelligence and your own verbal acuity, you want to keep that Luciferian intellect subordinate to the ability to see the burning bush when it manifests itself. And that's why attention should be support, subordinate to, to verbal acuity. Because you want to be open to the revelation of the divine, because that's what keeps your your Luciferian intellect in check. And I would say that's partly why it's reasonable for someone like Dostoevsky and then Solzhenitsyn to say, beauty will save the world. Because you have a revelation of the divine in the apprehension of beauty. And that's not, that has to be translated into, into, the, mm. into the verbal before it's... Yeah, so attention, yeah, that definition. Attention. You, attention, attention first, attention attention definition first. second. Well, and I would say the heavenly hierarchy, most fundamentally, is the hierarchy of attention. That is what it is. Is there also yeah. not, though, I mean, what, what do you make of the fact, I mean, Moses is hardly portrayed here as, you know, the hero. God says, go. He says, oh, who should I tell them sent me? And then he says, okay, well, listen. He says, well, they won't believe me. He says, okay, well, here's two miracles. Oh, but I'm not very eloquent. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, We're here's what's really interesting. Like, like he's, he's, problem a well, is it, like, <laughs> Moses is not, Moses is not <laughs> doubtful that this is God. This is not a matter of, I don't believe this guy. I mean, he, he knows he's talking to God and God is telling him to do this and he's trying to get out of it, right? I mean, clearly three or four times trying to say, oh, no, not me. So what I'm trying to get at is, and then God's going, God's going to kill him. And so that, what I'm trying to ask here is, what does this mean for us? Like, what is, you know, it, it appears as though obedience is also necessary to mm. the revelation. To the right thing. Yeah. To the well, revelation from God. it's a very common motif, mythologically, though, that the hero, the hero flees when first confronted with the dragon or the giant or with his responsibility. And I, I think that's a reflection of the fact that even if you're good, like Moses, and ready in some sense, when push comes to shove, you still might think, well, I'd rather be like Abraham. I, maybe I'd rather be back in the tent eating peeled grapes. And that's grapes, not presented you know? as a virtue here, I don't no, think. No, no, no. I don't, I don't think it is a virtue. I think it's a human failing that's, that's mm. built mercifully you, into the narrative. That's, that's Clint Eastwood. It's Clint Eastwood yes, it in Unforgiven, yes. right? It's Kevin Costner at the opening of The Bodyguard, right? This is a motif that's everywhere. And part of it goes into, I think, Dennis, you were remarking yesterday that a lot of people who are leaders, who are the leaders who we want, would not be people who want to be leaders, right? right? That's a trope they, that's quite they old. They don't want power, Hereditary, for sure. That's right. And so the fact that Moses is kind of hemming and hawing on the one hand seems like, you know, he's fetching, right? But on the other hand, there's an aspect that you want somebody who's not saying, great, I'm so glad God spoke right, to me, God I got good. this, right? Well, and also, Get behind me, God, and, and, here we and go. Isn't, yeah. And isn't the message here that, that, that to regular Joe's like me, that God can use you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, right, your impediments, your, your not being articulate, your not being the right, I mean, the message here surely has got to be that mm. God's work is brought about by broken vessels, mm -hmm. by well, imperfect and, and, well, and people. Also, well, also, maybe even more than that in some sense is that the brokenness might be a precondition for a kind of revelation yes. that couldn't occur without that particular yes. kind of brokenness. Yes. And so, and that touches back. But again, at remember, to, remember what he's facing. I mean, uh, my family were friends of Wilberforce, and I'm always amazed at his personal mission statement about slavery, which in his day was an incredible idea. But imagine this. I mean, he, slavish people and the greatest empire maybe ever. Right, and, this and, is and no necessary preconception that slavery is in some essential sense wrong. Right, I mean, well, for us now, well, not, one not of the in, revelations here seems to be... He well, knows that's what he I, wants to free his people. I know, I know, but, but it's there not like the Egyptians necessarily think that what they're doing is wrong. Oh, no, right? absolutely. Now, at least in the world, quite, I would say there's the a universal conception. Divinely right. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, and justified by, well, justified by power. So, I and would why have, wouldn't you justify I, I, it by I power? I would have ducked this. I'm, I'm, I bet most of us would have. Well, I think most of us do, <laughs> you know, all the time. And no wonder, right? It's no wonder. And, and that might be the, 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 the sin of, of false humility in some sense. There's a lovely story of Coleridge, if I may just interject, of where he used to go on holiday on the uh, south coast of England. And sometimes there were cargo 
uh, from vessels that were shipwrecked. And uh, the locals would look out for these, these shipwrecks because, of course, the, of the value of all things they would, they would discover. And apparently, Coleridge was observing this one morning on his morning constitutional and was recorded saying, ah, the providential shipwreck. Maybe I'm a providential shipwreck. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, right, that, right, that right. but that's of course a deep, I mean, from the poet of the ancient mariner. Um, but that's, that's a deeply. It's not such a bad way to conceptualize yourself. And I think when you love someone, you sort of con conceptualize themselves that way too, you know, because this is especially true within families because you're sort of thrown into your family. And so you're sort of with people who are on average like other people and they have their idiosyncrasies and their weaknesses, but the fact that you love them means that you do regard them as providential shipwrecks. You, you, you could replace them with something perfect, but then they wouldn't be the person that you love. And to Stephen's term, everyone's a broken vessel, right? And the break is the point at which, the, 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 the break, the flaws are the point at which, we were talking about this a little bit, um, the conversation yesterday about excising um, versus integrating. Remember that when we were discussing that? And part of the integration is that, that part, the parts of us that are broken should always be there and broken. That's the gift against which you hurl the other parts of yourself against to grow them larger. It's not that you eliminate it, right? It's not that you repress it. And so all those broken aspects of it and the broken vessel is, it's like, it's, it's the, it's the God given or evolutionarily selected, depending on which way you come from it, gift that gives you the thing against which to hone yourself. Uh, I'm just mesmerized. I am sorry. I, I stopped the providential shipwreck. <laughs> and I, I was thinking when I call my wife tonight, honey. You are my providential shipwreck. Yeah, yeah. Let us know how I, it goes. I, I will let you know how it goes. <laughs> and as well as I know her, I'm not sure how she will react. I'm just sensing for the a, record. a new line of Douglas, uh, of Douglas Hallmark cards. <laughs> well, Providence may have a shipwreck in your future. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee. And return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet, they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead, which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass. And he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. And then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. I got to stop there for a second. I do not understand what happens in the section with Zipporah. So, can, do Jonathan, I, can I offer? Can yes, I offer? please do. I thought I you might offer? have some, right. some insights yeah. into so, that. So I want you to, I want you, let's, let me do it in narratively for you first, okay. and then maybe you can get a sense of what is going on here. So this, what's happening here is actually the same thing that happened with the rod and the snake. And it's the same thing that happened with the, the, the disease hand and the, and the, let's say, uh, healed hand in the heart. Okay. So, and it's the same thing as removing the sandals that Moses removes his sandals as he goes into the burning bush. And it's ultimately the same thing as escaping Egypt and going up the mountain. It is about removing the foreign and finding the heart. 
And so the, the circumcision is the garment of skin that is removed in order to remove, in, in order to reveal the central rod. Oh. Okay. But it's also the mark of the foreigner, at least for, for Israel. It is that, that, the way that I recognize someone's not one of us is because he's got that garment of skin. So you remove the garment of skin, but that removal of the garment of skin is all about this idea. So that, that exposes the rod. That's exposes the circumcision the rod. That's right. idea. Circumcision, it's, the, it's the, the, the snake that that becomes the rod. It's all of these things to together. To return to Eden. To return to Eden because you, 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 you remove the garments of skin and you enter into, so the same. He removes the sandals. So it's an and exacerbation he, of nakedness. Yeah, the circumcision to the prelapsarian, the pre-full state of. Isn't of it also an inoculation, like the blood to for God to pass over on Passover on the door when she touches him with the blood? I don't know. I've never thought about that particular. But if you think about, it, I mean, she when she says she cast it at his feet, and in other, but it's it's, a, it's the sandals. He removed his sandals to get into. So she's. It's a relationship between this garments of skin and the feet. It's the bottom Is of it, your. I read somewhere your body, that feet is also. There's Dennis, sexuality related to it that as well. Se- isn't feet code for different? Aren't there different interpretations of what that means? Well, it, not in this case, but uh, in Ruth, it, it, it um, the the word is is generally regel, which doesn't mean much here. But the um, the holidays, for example, when the Jews would go to Jerusalem by foot, are called feet. The holiday shalosh regalim, the, the three. Festivals are the three feet. I don't know if that helps you in any way. But it's but. in the story of Ruth and Boaz. In the story of in the story of Ruth and Boaz, Ruth uncovers Boaz's feet. So there's a sexual connotation. That is a sexual connotation. Okay, so in part of this is she uncovers. She it, it's it's related to the yeah. It's, it's so there's, a, but there's a painting of him in a certain regard that allows God to pass over and not kill him. I don't think it, it's that the God was going to kill. And my understanding is that God is going to kill the son. That is by the so okay so to be completely unhelpful, <laughs> I just I'll just tell you that when I wrote my commentary, I I perused everything I could find. We we don't know exactly, and we don't know that in particular. Right. Was it Moses or the son? Maybe ambiguity is also. That's right. That's, that's right. exactly right. The, the fact the, is, though, that she saved them. Yeah. That that's important. And, okay. and so it's also Zipporah that saves. Okay, because I don't yes. understand. Because she's not Israelite, Israelite so. by the way. That's she's right. a, she's also a she's foreign Midianite, woman. Right. She's a foreign woman. But another she, foreign woman. Yeah, another Egyptians, woman and yeah. another foreigner. But she, saved the day. It's, but it, it has to do with spoiling the Egyptians in a certain manner as well, because it's the here's now the foreign woman who is proper removing that which is let's say improperly foreign but she, but but let's say keeping that which is properly foreign because she is a foreign woman and Moses only has at least that we know only has foreign wives right and so there's it's not it's not we have to be careful because we, we always we, we don't want to say like you have to just remove the strange remove the strange no mm-hmm. it's a more subtle relationship it's that you have to remove the strange that's not part of the system so think of a, right, but a you basketball team all the strange that is that part is of the so think of inside. a basketball team right if you have bad players you have to get rid of them if they don't fit you don't want people doing something else while you're practicing basketball if you got someone practicing the accordion it's like no that's strange remove it from the basketball practice please mm-hmm. but you have to keep your eyes open for that which is new and potential and not part of your system so that you can integrate the proper strange into, Dennis, into the world. Dennis, isn't that something rather simple and basic that is often, I, I read in the rabbis, you know, was, what was the sign of the covenant for Abraham? It was, this is the sign of the covenant. It was circumcision. This circumcision. But the so question clearly, is, why right. is that a sign of the covenant? In fact, the Hebrew, no, but you all words, know the word bris, I, or many yeah. of you, first, it's, it's called the circumcision, but bris means covenant. Yeah. It's Brit Mila. It is the, the, the covenant of circumcision. It doesn't the point here that a lot of people make is that here's the leader and his son is not circumcised. That's right. It, it is so an issue. And so it's time he yes, it got, got, took on he, hello. the sign of the yeah, covenant. That, that's part of it, definitely. So the okay. great prophet. What, what I was saying we don't know is we, we don't know why God got so angry and we don't know at whom. Yeah, that it looks like point. there's a piece of the story that's, that's missing. That's right. Feels that's that exactly. That way in the narrative. And by the way, in when whenever I've come to that, where, and I'm, it's not often, where there's a piece clearly missing to us, I always... Um, uh, console myself because I want to understand everything, but uh, uh, not everything in life, but everything in the Torah. Uh, but with this, it clearly was clear to them. The, uh, uh, 
the Torah has a, an incredible task, and so does all biblical literature, but the Torah is the oldest. Uh, it, had to be, it had to be important and meaningful to people in the late Bronze Age and to us. And that it succeeds is not argument 56 for me that it's a divine text. But they undoubtedly understood this story better than we do. But Dennis, would you also say that it's, it's part of scripture and divine revelation, that it's both accessible, uh, easy for an ordinary person to understand. That's good. And yet hard enough that's right. for, for philosophers. That's why we're to, sitting to around. Right. That's that's right. Right. That's that's right. He's the regular Joe. I like that. <laughs> that glad. cracked me up. Yes. Well, well, and, as, and, as the, and as the regular Joe, I just, just want to point out the, you know, the, the words in the book here that, that, you know, it's only verse 14 in which the anger of the Lord is kindled against Moses. It's only like, and now it's only verse 24 that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And relative to Moses' is, let's say, uh, uh, the, the, the instability in his will, you know, is, oh, do I really have to do it? I think this, this ritual marking is very important. I mean, if, if the book in a way is about the conforming or the, the revelation of this sovereign principle of all reality and the conforming of, of us or the Israelites in relation to that. Despite that, our inadequacies. Despite our inadequacies. I mean, you know, it can't be just an existential thing. Well, I kind of feel like today, I feel like I don't. And in a way, the, the, the ritual marking is a way of saying, you know, here, here I am. Well, it's a sacrifice. It's a yes, real it's a sacrifice, sacrifice and a marker that's permanent. So. And it conveys the important point that, that leaders are not exempt. Right. Yes. They, right. they don't get yes. special, special privileges. Yes. Well, They've on got... the point, too, that you're not exempt from the divine commandment despite your inadequacies, yeah. which because that can be an excuse, right? It's like, well, it can't be me. Look at the problems with me. It's like, yeah, you're full of problems, man. It's amazing <laughs> you can even ambulate, but that doesn't, that doesn't put you outside the divine order. I think you'll find it of interest on a human level. I, I, I don't cry often. I, I cried at both my son's circumcisions. And I, I'm not big into prayer, which is my own problem. I fully acknowledge I'm much more into study. But I, I, I was overwhelmed by being part of this tradition from Abraham to the present, that Jews did this in concentration camps, in, 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 in pogroms, and I'm doing it as well in California in the 21st or 20, well, 20th, 20th century. Uh, I, I, I just want you to know how much it means to many Jews. It, it, it's, and, and I fully acknowledge it transcends the rational. That, that, well, we're trying to understand why. Part some of degree. something so much bigger than me. I, I'm, I'm continuing this people that has been you know, the, the bush that is not consumed but burned all the time. So just, I, I thought you'd find that of interest because how powerful it can be. So the narrative picks up By the again. way, for one, forgive me. I, I got a call from a guy in San Francisco. This is the, 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 the joy of doing a radio show, who was the head of No Cirque, mm. which needless to say would be in San Francisco. <laughs> An anti, not only anti-circumcision, but was working to have his foreskin re restored. <laughs> and and I, I, I will never forget, I was, I was a little, it's very hard to stun me after all these years of radio. And I said, I'm sorry, did I get that right? You are working to restore your foreskin? And then I just, I don't normally insult callers. I just said, you must be very bored. <laughs> And that was the end of the I love that it's called No Cirque, and he called in to like, your show's like Cirque du Soleil. It's like a celebration. He <laughs> <laughs> right. needs some right. branding, <laughs> some branding help. All right, so back to the main narrative by all appearances. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met, a, met him in the Mount of God. Okay, so that's in the proper place, and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And so that's the next move down that hierarchy. Eh? And Aaron spake all the words, words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. 
So now the message is being translated. Right, but down it's only the and the reaction. This is the reaction because we talk again. We've talked about this before as well. Is that when we say act as if God exists, I always insist that acting as if God exists is not first a moral question. Is a question of where your attention is and what you celebrate. Mm -hmm. Worship is the first reaction of the realization of God. And it's not moral, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. pre-moral, right. right? It is, it is the just recognizing that this is the source of all things, that, that I am in contact with it, and that awe, sense of awe, That's you know, throws what? me to the ground in prostration. Pre-moral and pre-rational. Yeah. What's interesting. Or leaps you, leaps you to your feet in enthusiasm. Yeah. That's what people do when someone scores a goal. And it's because there's that archetypal element of hitting the targets. Like, if you're up and worshiping before, that's why people go there, is to have that experience. They don't know they're, they're participating in the divine in that game, but they wouldn't be going there and paying that money and, and watching this if, that, if it wasn't a form of worship, because it's a form of worship. What's necessary too for, I'm, I'm gonna use the term conversion loosely, but if you're gathering more people down the hierarchy like you're saying is, you need to embody in word and deed. Right, so this is part of what happened. Because on the one hand, you can look at it, you know, what more proof do you, do you need, right? But we're reading this in the Bible in real time. Th these are fairly insane propositions that are being presented. So it's important that- Dangerous that, ones too. Right, so you have leader, you have Aaron and you have Moses coming down and they're, they're proving this aspect of faith in word and deed, right? So that's a, that's a call to a certain purity of leadership if you wanna be a, you know, a role model or a leader. And well, if you want them. to bring the people out of tyranny instead of establishing one, right? So part of you has to be in touch with the divine, and that would be the open attention part, I would say, in some sense. And then part of you has to be able to speak magic words, and that combination, if it's genuine, that's enough to lead people out of tyranny. So, and then what, that is something to pray for all the time with political leadership. And you can see sometimes we have one or the other, you know, you have a man who's a good man, clearly, but who just can't communicate it. We've met political leaders like that in Washington, the impeccable moral character, but not convincing. That's right. And the number one thing when we poll the American public about what their biggest issues are with political leadership, it's always hypocrisy and corruption. Right, right. The so they're errands thing. without Moses. They're, right. That's, that, that, right, right, and that's why they, they can produce the golden calf, right. for example. So solidity of deed and word. Yeah, and it's so interesting here that that's so complicated to manage together that they have to be parsed into two people for that to be managed in the text. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. And you said there was trickery in this, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? And that's exactly what you expect from a tyrant. It's like, well, I'm God here. It's like, what are you talking about? These are my slaves. I own them. Why should I be letting them go? Who's telling me this? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go. We pray thee, three days journey into the desert. That's, that's out beyond the confines of civilization. And sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the amount of the bricks which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. So you see here, it's quite interesting because the tyrant, the Pharaoh, is the opposite of Moses. In some sense, he's received a divine revelation because Moses, who's the agent of God, has come to him and said, what you're doing is wrong. Give us a bit of a break. And the Pharaoh, instead of just saying no, says, no, not just no. It's like, you want a little freedom? Here's a little more slavery. And so here, we'll just make it a little bit harder, and that's what you get for asking for 
or even a modicum, even a modicum of freedom. And so we know already that the Pharaoh is the kind of tyrant who will double down even in the presence of legitimate authority. Okay. Yeah, that's the definition of tyranny. But you can see it fractally even at all levels within yourself. I think of an alcoholic who suddenly decides, I'm going to stop drinking and then watch him a few days later, like binged out of his mind, right? It's like there's a, there's a sense in between any time you try to free yourself from anything, the, 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 the thing you're trying to free yourself from doesn't want to let you go. No, no, Not no, only doesn't want to let you go, but if you start to manifest like a desire to get away, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll just bite down on you. you, bet, you bet. May I just, um, Note the feast and the sacrifice. Um, this is partly a question for Dennis. I mean, um, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And then the emphasis that uh, let us go to sacrifice. I mean, these, again, these are primordial concepts, the notion of the feast. Yeah, and, and the combination of the two, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's party and, and, and privation at the same time. It's that combination of... Exactly. I once had a conversation with an anthropologist who um, worked on, on feasts because we're the only animals who have meals. Um, and he was working on these ancient sites, I think about 60,000 uh, BC, where there are these circular remains where you can see that our ancestors started to um, to eat together uh, because our, our, our kin and the, and the rest of the animal kingdom, chimps, or whatever, they do not look at each other when they eat. Um, they certainly don't show their teeth to each other. And it's, it's very hierarchical. So the, the alpha gives the food to the others and, and uh, to the females, whatever. So this idea of the feast, the, the, the meal, eating it's together. It's communal. Communal. Well, yeah, communal. Well, and, and, well, and so interesting watching little kids. You know, when my daughter was like under two, I would sometimes just as a joke, take her dessert. And often she would shame me because I'd take her dessert and then I'd give it back and she'd say, here, dad, you can have it. And I'd think, oh God, kid. She stopped doing that at about three. So and that was interesting too, because there was a developmental transformation that's typical. But one of the things that's absolutely, utterly striking about children, it's, it's miraculous in some sense, is that they're really good at sharing food. And it's so deeply ingrained in, into us that, that, and part of the reason I've thought about this anthropologically and biologically is like, we, we weren't really big enough predators to be that successful against mammoths on our own. But 20 of us, we could take down a mammoth pretty well. We probably killed all of the mammoths in North America and in, 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 northern, in the northern, what is now the Soviet Union. It's pretty good for, you know, naked apes. And, but the problem with a mammoth is, was what, are you going to eat the whole thing? You can't really store it. And so what we learned to do in some real sense was store our excess hunting uh, store in the bodies of other people. And that was the best way to do it. It's like, well, if even if you're a great hunter, when you go out with your crew, you might not get an animal. The, someone else might. No matter how good you are, you're not 100% successful. But if there's 20 of you, one of you is going to be successful just about every time. And so if you share the food, what you're really doing in the most fundamental sense is you're, you're placing a moral obligation on someone else to share their future food with you. And it's it's, it's preservation of food in the most fundamental way. And so it's so paradoxical too, because what it means is that we learn that if you share food, which is a sacrifice, right? And, and that's another thing to think about in terms of the relationship between feast and sacrifice. Whatever you're eating, I don't get to eat. That's a sacrifice. It's like, well, yeah, but it's a sacrifice. It's so interesting. It, it is the sacrifice that brings plenty to everyone. To give up your food to others is the sacrifice that brings plenty to everyone. So, can, we, can we talk about, th there's an aspect of this ask to me that seems not in good faith. And I have a question if this is just my reaction or... So, I think there's trickery afoot. So part of this is, is first of all, Pharaoh said, sure, no problem, go for three days and come back. It doesn't seem like that would have been a sufficient answer to not incur the wrath of God. And the second thing is, is if they're gonna go off out of the reach and they're slaves, what's to say that they would come back? Like it's a very odd request. I think it's to show that even this minimal request would not be okay with Pharaoh. But the minimum request is not made in good faith. Right. It's to, it's to, 
Oh, okay, well, because well, theoretically... You know, that's not their Because God goal. says, I'm going to take well, you out and well, put you what, into the promised land. So that's if they what went for the three point. days and came back, then it would be okay. Then they could stay as slaves. That's why it's not fully in, in good faith, I think. Well, I did the point. But, it might, but it might, it's an interesting point. So you think that it, it might have been the only request that they were making? Well, I think partly what's going on here is that Pharaoh is himself being tested about whether he will true himself to the principle of all reality to God? And the answer, of course, turns out to be no, he won't. And a lot of what's going on in these chapters is the demonstration of the sovereignty of the principle against the resistance of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the story could have gone differently. I mean, that is to say, Pharaoh could have said, hey, you know what? I totally get this whole thing that you're revealing to me. I get it. Uh, I've been out of line. You know what? Go ahead. That would have been a different story, of you course. Know, leave, that's not the story it to, we have. Leave it to Blackwood that, to be a that's, Pharaoh that's, ally. That's not, I'm not a Pharaoh ally. I'm saying, I'm saying the story is such that what we can't assume it's bad faith because what we know is what Pharaoh actually does, and he's judged on the base of what he actually does. But his we heart just, is hardened, and we also know oh, we'll that... Get we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Oh, I, we'll I, get to I, that. I, I but defend, that also brings... It's super interesting because the Pharaoh is trying from the beginning to reduce Israel to potential, to reduce them to slaves that serve Israel, uh, Egypt but don't have their own identity. And now, like Moses is saying, the God of Israel has shown himself to us. Like that's a pretty threatening for Pharaoh. It means like it means that the, the the thing that holds you together, the thing that makes you exist as a people, like the God of your He's ancestors, back. is back. And it's like ah uh, no, not happy. that's right. I don't want I don't want any of that. I don't want I did like I don't even want I don't want you to celebrate that God. Because you celebrate that God, it means that you are going to bind as a people. You're going to have an identity. I don't want that. I want you to be a bunch of riffraff slaves that do whatever. Sure, you want. but there's not. But what all I'm saying is that it's, that that that. that it's, it's not bad faith to want to do that. And I mean, Pharaoh's being judged for his refusing to allow that to happen. So I think really what's going on, I mean, it's like Jordan says, do not lie, right? Not because, I don't know, God will punish you in some kind of external, you know, like butler or, you know, someone out there is coming in to just, you know, externally make, make your life difficult because why shouldn't you be able to lie? No, but because you're lying is wrong because it pits you against the very nature of what's real and true. And so good luck with that. And I think that's what's going on with Pharaoh. So you don't think that, because the thing is, so the thing is that if you understand that this is also, this whole thing of Israel and Egypt is a, lit, is a big repetition of Abraham going to Egypt and lying to the Pharaoh about his wife, and now you've got, and then try, so, so that you can get out of trouble, now you've got the same pattern here. So it's hard not to see that there's something trick of trickery afoot. I, I also love how we've, we've attributed do not lie to Jordan. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's my highlight. Well, it, it's just Jordan's explication I'm just of made, the commandment. I just made it popular. Did you not make that up? <laughs> Did you come up with bring, that? Bring up? back not lying. Are you saying that's in here somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible terrible thing to have to bring I back. Just, it's like, remember this rule? But but the, but it, but God's also made clear that he's going to lead them out of slavery, not that he's going to lead them out for a three-day party. It's not like it's a... Well, well I think yeah, we can live so with the ambiguity. We can live that with doesn't, the that does, None of that Pharaoh knows. And, 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 I, and I don't think we can understand the text simply in the language of trickery, yeah. because what's going on in Pharaoh's resistance is that's a titanic force of reality <clears throat> that... that, that we will see how it is resolved. Yeah, well, and he's not, he's obviously not guilty about the whole the slave thing. It's like, no, no, forget it. And like, just because you asked, we're going to whack see, you a Pharaoh's bunch of times. See, Pharaoh's judged on his own actions too, right? This isn't, uh, he's not a pawn. I mean, he, he's, he's an agent in this story. But he's in Egypt, he's God. Right. Mm. But they, well, he thinks he's God. So no, I, well, I'm in, in be, Egypt, he, he is God. Right, that's right. And in he's Egypt, the he freest man yeah. in Egypt. Yeah. So that... Yeah. I'm going to bring you to all the way, because you're Christians, I'm going to bring you all the way to, 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 to the New Testament, which is that trickery in the land of, of, uh, of the stranger can reestablish order. And the final example that we believe in, the, in, in Christianity is that when Christ dies and goes into death, death thinks that it has won, but it's all a trick. It's a trick on death. And that's how it's presented in the Gospel of Nicodemus. That's how it's presented in the tradition of the harrowing of hell, which is that here comes the here comes the Son of God. We succeeded, and then wait, what's going on? This is not what we thought, and then it flips. So I think that the pattern of trickery in the land of the stranger 
something, we call it something like the double flip, the double inversion, which is like in the land where everything is upside down and everything is wrong, there's a manner in which some, some kind of trickery is afoot. Well, there's, there's trickery and there's deception, right? Because I think what's, well, the, difference, the difference is that in, you know, deception, what I'm trying to argue here is simply this, is that, is that Pharaoh's being judged on his own terms. He's, there's not a setup as if, well, that wasn't very fair to Pharaoh. No, I mean, no, no, no. I think he's being judged in his own terms. Or even just if it as, wasn't fair just to as him. The, just as the centurions are, just as the thief on the cross is, just as, so what I'm saying is that there can be a plan you're not aware of afoot, but what's, the game isn't fair if you're being judged for actions you didn't take. And so, yeah, okay, I didn't know the whole picture, but I still did what was right or wrong. But there is something of the art of the deal here, isn't there? Because eventually Ferris says, oh, you can yeah, go, go, but with, without the yeah. cattle. And, and mo no, not a yeah. hoof must be left behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the demands get stronger. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I to it? Oh, oh, okay. talk to you, Dan? No. no, 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 please, finish. Now, I was raise another point. That let my people go is the most famous words mm -hmm. in the whole book and the cry of many liberation movements. But my Jewish friends say to me, the extraordinary thing is, the word freedom doesn't come in Exodus at all. Well, the it's whole a, book's right. about it, the only, but the word freedom the, isn't it's there. It's interesting. The, the, Why? the modern Hebrew word for freedom is chirut, and, it's, and I don't believe it's in the Torah. The, the word in Leviticus, which is on a liberty bell, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the, generation, uh, the land, through all its inhabitants, is another word which is rarely used. I think it's Doror, and uh, and so you're right. Uh, interestingly, it, it, it's it's an ab. The Torah is not a fan of abstract concepts. But that's well, it's true. also it, it doesn't have a word for equality. Well, Moses it doesn't, doesn't have a word. Let my people go, Dennis. He hmm? says, doesn't have a word for uh, equality. Yeah, equality. He, he doesn't say just let my people go. It says let my people go. That they may hold a feast unto me in the serve. wilderness. Right? They can so serve it's a, God. Exactly, it's not freedom. Exactly. Like, no, no, no. What is freedom? Exactly. What is that? It's exactly. nothing. Freedom is not. They, they, they leave so to be a slave of God. Like they're leaving Egypt to become, enter into this covenant and enter into the law of God. Right, like it's right. not an like, abstract, right, like random freedom. Which the freest. Because that is the, so that I, is. I have, I, I, yeah. I just want to know, <laughs> I'm very curious. You said, and I, I didn't obviously want to interrupt. So you said that children normally share food, Jordan. <laughs> so my uh, my non scientific uh, experience has been that when I've been to birthday parties of little kids, you see kids with eight cupcakes, mm -hmm. barely yeah. able to hold them. Share one with 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 little uh, Devin here. No. Yeah. Well, there's there's it's context dependent because you do see flips of that with children as well. But there are certainly situations in which. They'll absolutely, they'll absolutely feed other people and they'll share food with their parents. And so it's okay, fine. children, I, I, children I, I, flip uh -huh. frames of, of conception quite quickly and they can certainly snap into a very selfish mode. There's also a cupcake exemption. Oh, yeah, there is that too. Oh, yeah. And maybe there's birthday party that, cupcake that's right, exemption. Because I've only yeah. seen it yeah, with yeah, cupcakes. Yeah, that's yeah right, yes. right, 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 right. <laughs> try it, right, with, try so it with celery and see what happens. <laughs> Just a very quick interjection. Yeah. I mean, over this notion of freedom, um, I mean, even with an abstract philosophical instrumentarium that you find in, say, Greek. Um, if you look at the origins of that abstract vocabulary, it often has a social background. So that the, the origins of, say, the concept of, of freedom in, uh, in, in ancient Greek philosophy has really to do with whether you're a slave or free. Um, so the, you know, the, the. So you still have social obligations if you're free. You're a citizen then, rather than a slave. Well, yes, but you're, you're, you're the, the concept of, the abstract concept of freedom has, has etymological roots in straightforward social status, actually, which, which you still, uh, so in, in, I mean, in German today, a word for a baron, a Freiherr, is literally a free lord, right? So, and that's, but that's, that's a strictly social, uh, status term. And, so the, the, actually the link between, as it were, the, the, uh, the, the sort of 
almost banal social structure and then the abstract philosophical terminology um, uh, is, is quite an interesting story itself. So, so you think a, that at least to begin with, there's no real there's no real notion of freedom. Well, this is a big this is a, this is a big question. I mean, so, so there are lots of um, scholars who would debate, you know, to what extent does the concept of the person, to what extent does the concept of the will, to what extent is 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 freedom. Uh, you know, where does that emerge? And and some, in fact, would say that, you know, in the West, the whole concept of the, the, the free person actually develops very late, you mm -hmm. know, with, now, with, that makes with sense. Augustine, well, you know. And, you, you at least see here that it's sort of like, your, Dennis, your conception of how you came to God is through the back doors. You come to freedom through the back door here. We don't know what freedom is here, although we do know it's associated perhaps with having a feast to God in the wilderness, but we know it's not slavery. Right. Right. That's so good. the That's negative good. is fleshed out, but right. not the positive. Okay. So by the way, if it, uh, since it, 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 you have forced me to say what I just said earlier about the lack of conception uh, uh, in the Torah of, of these words, equality and and freedom, and it this will blow my Christian friends' minds. I don't think love in the in, as a noun appears in the Torah. Love as a verb, definitely. The Torah cares how you be, it, 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 it's really not an abstract instrument. Mm -hmm. This so is, that is how associated you behave. Doing, 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 yeah. doing, right, doing, right. doing. I, I, and I have totally, as a Jew and as a human, internalized that. My, my whole thesis on happiness, which is a huge part of, of my thinking and my writing, is you should act happy even if you do not feel it because you owe it to others to have a happy disposition. So I, I have taken, I, I realized subconsciously. So are you actually happy to be here? <laughs> <laughs> I am acting happy. Today. Well, you're, doing, you're, yeah. you're convincing yeah. us. That's so right. so that'll, do. That that'll do. That matters. That's yeah. exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I really imbibe this in my life. I am such a behaviorist, and I know I got it from the Torah and Judaism. So, may I tell, I got, I'm sorry, but my, my all-time favorite anecdote, fourth grade in yeshiva. I remember very little from fourth grade. The rabbi announces, okay, boys, because it was only incumbent upon the boys. This is an Orthodox Jewish school. He goes, it's time to daven mincha, meaning it is time for the afternoon prayer. And being who I always was, very respectfully, but with chutzpah, I walked over and I go, uh, uh, Rabbi Fostag, I'm not in the mood to, to daven mincha. <laughs> the guy was from Eastern Europe. He spoke English, but he had clearly never, it was obvious to me, heard mood and pray in the same sentence. <laughs> and the guy thinks, he looks up, he strokes his beard, and he goes, Shmuel Prager, that's my Hebrew name, Shmuel. Shmuel Prager is not in the mood to daven mincha. <laughs> So what? <laughs> the man changed my life. I, I, I mean it utterly sincerely. I have said to myself, when I have not been in the mood to do the right thing all of my life, so what? Mm. Right, right. Why is it about and you? And that is so Torah-like. It's, it's, mm. You don't feel it? Big deal. It's why the Torah is not conceptual. Act it. Have a great day. Mm. Okay, good. And the gentlemen, king. real quick. So I have to go to see about a dog on the other coast. So I'm going to cut out early. And yes. I will see you all tomorrow. Yes. And yes. thank well, you. We're sorry to hear about that. Thank you. So. I'll okay. be back for tomorrow's session. Okay. Okay. Thanks, okay. Greg. Thanks, thank Greg. You. Thanks, Greg. And thank you for the help. And the Pharaoh doubles down again. The king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore you? Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let there be more work laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. 
and the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers and they spake to the people saying, thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where you can find it. Yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And so now Moses has actually made it worse for them. So that's annoying. And so and people are going to be irritated about God for that. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded. Wherefore have you not fulfilled your task in making brick, both yesterday and today, as heretofore? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants. And they say to us, Make brick, and behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. But Pharaoh said, You are idle, you are idle. Therefore you say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall be no straw given to you. Yet you shall deliver the tale of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. After it was said, Ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto him, them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of the servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Well, and so you see this motif in, it, in the story of Abraham. As soon as Abraham is called out of his tent by God, it's like things get way worse for Abraham. Mm. They do, and I wonder to what degree that's that's a that's a desert motif right there. Is that here? Here it's actually an, an, an exacerbation of order. This is what we're seeing because in the, the the biblical thinking, there's a relationship between rest, Sabbath, and worship. And so what the Pharaoh was saying, because they're saying, we're going to go worship our God. And Pharaoh says, no, you're going to work. Mm -hmm. No Sabbath for you. It's all order, all the way down, all the time. Civilization, like the, the negative aspect of civilization. Mm -hmm. You will work nonstop. You will not rest. Instrumental, though. Instrumental yeah. orders, mm -hmm. you're saying. Well, they're being reduced to agents yeah. of instrumentality. Okay. And so you can really see the danger of, like, absolute system systematization, absolute order, where there's no place for the private. There's no place to hide from the, the you know, the, the big brother's there's I, no which feast. is there's exactly no, there's no feast there's no there's no rest there's no hiding it, it's order all the way down this is the like the, the a 1984 idea that like there's no place for anything else but the system but that's a kind of totalitarian order here right yeah. which is precisely what's overturned by a greater order well it's it's that the the, the order that god gives is a, is a mitigated order which which is balances out heaven and earth as he did in creation itself but now it's like it's just heaven like it's just light all the way down work Civilization, you know, no, no, no well, rest. I was thinking it was a desert prodroma, so to speak, because when the Egyptians first try to flee from tyranny, or when the Israelites first try to flee from tyranny, instead of things getting better, they get worse. Yep. Now, I know it's a consequence of the exacerbation of order, but for the, for the, for the Israelites, it's like, well, we tried to resist tyranny, and now, now things are worse it's more tyranny. better. Yeah, more tyranny. Yeah. 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 The, 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 this is, by the way, a recurring theme, apparently, with tyrants. When, uh, mm -hmm. when the, uh, the Czech Jew assassinated, uh, was it Heydrich? Heydrich, no. yeah. Was it Heydrich? Yeah, 42. And uh, the Nazi official Heydrich. And, and so uh, Hitler ordered all the, 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 the men of, of that village, Lidice, right? 
in Czech, what was then Czechoslovakia to be murdered. Mm-hmm. Tyrants double down. They double they down. They double down. That's right. Mm-hmm. If, if I can get cruel enough, you'll finally mm-hmm. give in. Well, they've already, con- this is partly why the Pharaoh's heart is hardened. If I've already convinced myself that I'm right, th- and the farther I've gone in convincing myself that I'm right when I'm not, the more price I have to pay if I admit that I'm wrong. And so at some point it gets to the point where it's, it's much easier to double down than to think, oh my God, I'm, I'm Hitler. Like, <laughs> who wants to think that? Who wants to realize that? And at some point the realization is so awful that there's no way that you can manage it. So. I think you made the point. I think we, this was touched on earlier or, um, or I dreamt about you, but, uh, <laughs> but something uh, that taking it completely away from tyrants and evil, just in normal life, it's very common for people caught in something to double down. Yeah, 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 exactly. Wasn't that said yet? Was that said yesterday? Uh, possibly, possibly. Yeah, this is, this, so this is the, your, uh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah, well, and more, the more tyrannical you are, almost by definition, the more that's but, but likely But just to be even the case. In, in a normal day, uh, the, the guy's caught having an affair, and, and, you know, and instead of saying, I'm so sorry, this is awful. Yeah. He doubled down on, uh, with his lies and and and, well, and, see, and and keeps attacking her. Well, well, well oh, you, you don't trust me? What kind of wife yeah, are you? Yeah, right, right. Well, you see this with politicians all the time, too. They get caught with their hand in the cookie jar, and then they say, well, no, no, I didn't do that. I couldn't do that. I'm not that person. And then often they get no, in more trouble. No, what they say is, from... I'll give you a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, often, that's the worst. They often get in more trouble <laughs> for the doubling down than they than they would have if they would have just said, well, yeah, 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 you know, I screwed up, I'm an idiot. We had a politician in Canada who was premier of Alberta for a long time, Ralph Klein, and Ralph had a drinking problem and he had a lot of flaws, but people really liked him because he was one of these shipwrecked vessels, you know? It's like, Ralph would just say, oh yeah, I'm such an idiot, I'm trying to get better. Like, he got his bachelor's degree when he was premier of Alberta because he hadn't had one and he went to university while he was premier to get his bachelor's degree by correspondence, you know? And so he was a guy who could say, yeah, you know, I'm stupid and I'm tyrannical. Sorry, sorry, everyone. Uh, you caught me. I'm dumb. And then he was he was premier for a very long time, and people liked him a lot. They kind of felt he was, you know, he was one of us. We've got flaws too, man. So that's an he didn't double down. Interesting he didn't story. double down. So then the Lord said unto Moses, "Oh, we're in we're in Exodus six now. We're in Exodus six now." Then the Lord said unto Moses. Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. This is the catastrophe of doubling down, right? It's like, and it's weird that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. You think, well, what's God up to? Well, God is in some sense responsible for everything. So you can't just hand wave that away. But the tyrant doubles down and that's a consequence. And there's going to be consequences. I saw this in my clinical practice all the time when people double down is that they made things worse very, very rapidly. Mm-hmm. So, now thou shalt see what I will do to Pharaoh, to the tyrant, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, and, and that's a justification to Moses. He, Moses says, look, I got in a lot of trouble, you know, fall into your orders here. And <laughs> the, it's a lot worse for the Israelites. No wonder they're complaining. And God says, you, you wait. The Pharaoh is not just going to let you go. He's going to insist that you go. You're going to have a victory that's even greater than the victory that you would have had. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by, not, by name Jehovah, I was not, was I not known to them. And I've also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I've remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land, unto the land, concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. 
and I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? It's a reference to his inability to speak there. And the Lord spake unto Moses and said, and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass on the day when the Lord spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord, speak thou unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. And Moses said once again, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? So Moses is in a hell of a conundrum here because he's convinced the Israelites in some sense that he's a legitimate agent of God. And then he, he bearded the dragon in his den and faced the Pharaoh. And the Israelites were in trouble before, but now they're really in trouble. So now they won't even listen to him. And hypothetically, they believe him. And God still says, yeah, well, go talk to the Pharaoh again. It's no wonder Moses is rejecting. It's like, really? Really? This, this didn't seem to have worked so far. And now, back into the fray. So, Exodus 7. Well, can we... Yes, please, go right ahead. Now, I remember hearing, a, whatever you call it, as a Jew, a, a sermon, we would call it, but they're pointing out that incredible passage in Hebrew, and I don't speak Hebrew, Dennis does, it starts, I am the Lord, mm -hmm. and then there are 50 words that deal with the past, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then I am the Lord, and 50 words dealing with the future, and then I am the Lord. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. fascinating. And it's heavenly, uh, what you call it, a chiasmus, where you have Yes, but the, the, I didn't know the 50-50, that's fascinating. 50 Hebrew words, and, and the great, I am the Lord. Hmm. The self-affirmation. Yeah. Hmm. It's, uh, and divided striking. temporally that way. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, I, 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 but by my name, Jehovah, Yahweh, I was not known. Right, right. And, see, it's and what, a lot of Christians mis there? Why is, misunderstand why is that? that. Because Yahweh comes 160 odd times in Genesis. I know. It's, 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 so, you know, it was written by Moses, right? What? At least according to the tradition, it was, it was written by Moses. I know, but... Um, that it, that it might have been a, a revelation of the time of Moses that was we were put back into knowing, like, oh, this was it's like we have now the highest revelation of something which has of someone or a God that has been revealing Himself to us until now, and now we have. Well, now we know we, it's we know we, we know the well, name. Well, there's another possibility, yeah. and that is the name was known, but the meaning was not. Mm. Yeah. And now they, uh, what you've the all been saying. The meaning was just given at the burning you, bush. Yeah. There was no meaning yeah. to, to God's oh, name oh, before. Oh, oh, oh. But now you'll see okay, it in Okay, so there's new attributes of, well, yes. look. You're going to know in action. Know action yeah. Well, well you, that, that makes sense because the Bible is revelatory. And what that means is that what's being revealed is the nature of the Spirit of God. And so with it's each progressive, progressive story, absolutely. Yeah. With yeah. each progressive so now you know story, you know more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and that just continues mm -hmm. with each. I mean, in, it's, it's so true from a narrative sense that the Bible is a sequence of revelations of character. It's like, well, who's God? Well, first of all, he makes order out of chaos. And second, it's the order that's good. And then he... He's the spirit you walk with when you're unselfconscious in the garden. And then he's that which prepares Noah to batten down the hatches. And now he calls you to adventure. And each of those is, oh, that's what God is. It's, then that, those things are really qualitatively different. And, and it's, it's even a miracle that you can, in some sense, see them as a unity. Right? And say, oh, all those different things. Those are the same thing. Well, what is that? Well, the, I guess that's what it is. That's where we get it here. All those things that have already been revealed 
are now shown to be a manifestation of the cardinal principle of being itself. Yeah. And that's, right. I mean, you see it because before that like God is constantly revealing himself with all these names, like all these different names, different aspects mm -hmm. of God. And then we get to this revelation of God as being itself or the ground of being itself. And I think that that, I think it's, it's, that's hinted at in the text also. Cause you see, you know, before that, it's like Abraham called upon God with this name and then he called upon God with this name. And so they have all these different names for something which is revealed like I'm not saying they didn't think it was the same. But right. I'm saying that, that in this, this revelation that Moses have, has, it's all, it all comes it all together. Comes together. Well, but, but and then would, they receive the land. It's like there's something too, related to that as well. If we think about this anthropologically, if all these fragmented tribal groups going back a tremendous amount of time, each had a God, and to some degree, their association with that God was a pointer to what was transcendent, and then the tribes unified, then there was all these multiple names of God. You see that in the Mesopotamian creation stories, because... Marduk has like 200 names, and each of those names is a different aspect of Marduk, but each of those names was a separate tribal god. And so, well, that's God, and this tribe thinks, no, that's God, and this tribe thinks, no, that's God. And, and then the tribes come together and they think, well, in some weird way, all of that, or what's common among all of that is God, and so you, and that's part of the building of this hierarchy yeah, But Jordan, well. you're, not, you're not saying the Israelite tribes did that. Well, no. I, I, I don't know. Because no, they we, all had Abraham. I, they all had the same God. It got rather vague when they were captive, but you could understand it, it at aspects, and it's it's fine. It doesn't it doesn't crash. Let's say the the, the 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 sacred story, but you can see the same happening in the time of Plato. The same thing is going on, where you have these people starting to get a sense of there's something behind these right. phenomena. There's something behind. It. So, like, is it the, is it the spirit of water? Is it the the quality of water? Is it the quality of fire? Is it the quality of this? And like, yeah. it's like no, 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 and then. Uh, finally moving on to this notion of being or this. Right. And it's outside of nature as well. Well, I would say the, the biblical story, and I don't know how to conceptualize this. I mean, I think biologically and evolutionarily over the whole span of, I, I don't want to say I think over the span of cosmic time, but I'm not in a conceptual world that has its borders at 6,000 or 25,000 years. And so there's a prehistory to all of this history. And God only knows what was happening in the tribal communities that we have no record of. No, at I some point, that. they were fragmented but familial not the kin groups. Not the Hebrew tribes. No, 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 no. By that time, they've aggregated to a tremendous degree. But before that, who knows for how long, well, hundreds of... Sorry, Elohim is a, is a plural form, isn't it? Yeah. So, so there's, there, there would. I mean, one of the extraordinary things with this text, and uh, it it strikes me all the more going through it uh, in this group, is this monotheistic assertion of you know the self affirmation, I am, you know, I am, and there's a unity. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there's clearly, obviously, at one level, the surrounding nations, all with their their gods. Um, and presumably some sort of ancestral memory, perhaps, of a, of a period. And, and indeed, the continuing temptation to forms of idolatry so that this has to be That's reinforced. That's disintegration. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, and yeah. you think it's such a miracle because what we're faced with isn't a unity. It's, it's an in, incredible plethora of diverse forms. And so to even have the, you, the, and of people and their diverse abilities and, and proclivities and to, to get even a glimmer of the idea that, well, no, in some way that's, that's transcendent and incomprehensible, but also necessary, all of this diversity is also held together and must be held together in a unity. It has that's, to be a unity. And, and, and I think, because there can't be more than one I am that I am. Right. right? right there can't right. be more it's than one God of whose essence is existence. So there can't be more, there can't be two existences. Right. right. right? There's got yeah, but so that's the scandal of that asserted over all the diversity. Right. 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 Absolutely. So what you're, I think what you're seeing in just from chapters four onwards is just this sort of unpacking the unfolding of what we, of those, those insights at, uh, well, uh, in, well, in chapter three. Well, people do say when they have mystical experiences, they do say, that they get a deaf, a direct apprehension of a pre-linguistic unity, right? That it's like the scales fell from my eyes and I could see everything in its totality, one thing, the oneness of everything. But it's, you it's, could put that as the Easterners do into a Buddhist framework or a, a Hindu framework, and that would be different. Because well, that's just, that's a monism or a pantheism, whereas this is 
monotheism. Mm. God is separate from creation. Well, there is that element and of... And yet creation uh, is completely dependent upon on God. Him, and so monotheists it, yeah. still, I mean, they're, they're always having to try and tread this tightrope between monism and dualism because we want to say that creation and creator are actually distinct. That's just absolutely crucial. There's kind of there's God's being and then there's borrowed being, right? It's being that is this participated being of creation and unparticipated being of, of, of God. No, I agree with you. But you're almost saying as if we have to say it this way, otherwise, you know, our thinking goes wrong. Right. Whereas what you're saying is what yeah. the Bible yeah. says well, is yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you look at, at uh, concepts of the Holy Mount, like like the, the Greek pantheon, when you, and you think of gods like Zeus, who, who, who ruled over the Titans and who was, in some sense, an emergent monotheistic god, do you see, do you see Zeus as, a, as, as merely a god of nature? Do you see a glimmer in that, at least of the idea that there's some transcendent unity that's outside the natural order? Well, I think there's a reaching and a groping Toward the, that, yeah, but this is. But Zeus is a revolutionary god. Zeus is not. Zeus is not the same as this. The the the, pan, the, the pagan pantheons, the cosmogony in particular, is presented as a series of revolutions, and so there is within within the pagan sphere there is what like Christians and, and, and many monotheists later will have this idea, the rebellion of the angels, mm -hmm. that is that there are multiple gods, like there are multiple principalities, but they they take their, they try to take their power from above. And so Zeus, you know, Saturn castrates his father and then Zeus True, takes but, power but, but, from, from that, his own father. But, There's this, but, but there this cycle. There are hints of it. I mean, if, if there are hints of it in, in, in Greek polytheism, if you think of, of the Iliad, which is really the foundational kind of theological text for, for ancient Greece, the, you got, you know, Zeus is both a kind of capricious, hempecked husband, um, but he's also, there are flashes, I think it's, it's, it's just right right in the first few lines of the Iliad, it's, it's this dios de teleto bula, that the will of Zeus was accomplished through. So there's this idea that, that the whole of the Iliad is sort of fated, almost as kind of a providential, monotheistic providentialism. Yeah, there are and, you could say and, there are glimmers. And, and then, then Neil tried to make Zeus into yeah. something like Well, yeah. this brings us actually to... It's I ambiguous. Think, yeah. Yes, I mean, there's, a, there's a, the, the, the question in a sense that, again, this is slightly off topic, but the, the, the big question that Gibbon is asking, right, I mean, the, about the, uh, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire, the 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 the, 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 um, the 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 fall of the classical culture and the rise of barbarism, as as uh, Gibbon puts it, and of course by barbarism he means Christianity. That question: of Why, why was Christianity able to take over the the Roman Empire? Why wasn't it the Mithras cult or or, mm -hmm. or some other you know popular religion? And I think one answer to that question is in fact monotheism, which is basically derived from this text. Not a unifying force. Yeah. And and of course, because there, there, there were monotheistic there, there were monotheistic tendencies in Greek yeah. philosophy, yeah, but yeah. not in the cult. And in the Persian and Empire so, as well. Yeah. Like it was there. Yeah, well, we, we were discussing at, this yesterday. I mean, you know, a pantheon of gods, if you've got a whole sort of group of um, often kind of quarreling gods, mm -hmm. there isn't a sort of single discernible divine will that you can act upon as a people. Right, There's right. So around. you're fragmented. Right. Well and it's yeah. a it's a reflection of fragmentation of culture, I would say. Well, if you look at Mesopotamia, what happens is that the Mesopotamian gods are, are multiple, and then they're threatened by Tiamat, who's the force of chaos, essentially. And under the pressure of the threat, they organize themselves into a hierarchy, and a new god is born, and that's Marduk. And Marduk has these interesting um, features. They say about Marduk, he has eyes all the way around his head, so he's attention, and he speaks magic words. So he'll he'll speak the the cosmos into being out, or the day sky into being out of the night sky. So he's he's attention and magic words. And the Mesopotamians figured out this is something, you know, that the highest god, when you're confronted by chaos, the gods have to organize themselves into a hierarchy such that attention and the word are put at the pinnacle, and then the Mesopotamian emperor was charged with being a good Marduk. He had a moral duty to do that. And at the New Year ceremony, they used to take him out of the city and strip him of his emperor clothes. And the priest would slap him with a glove and say, 
repent. How did you not pay attention and speak properly this year? How were you not a good avatar of Marduk? And then the, the emperor would have to say, well, here's all the reasons I wasn't good. And then they would re, they would, in a ritual, they would reenact the battle of the gods and the triumph over, over Tiamat and reconstitute the cosmos. And you can see a real yearning towards a uh, monotheism there and a, and also that revelation of something that's quite close to the notion of the of the word, right? Because you know, Marduk is definitely a master. This may be a bit of... far-fetched, but listening to you, it struck me a kind of forerunner of Hobbes's Leviathan, the war of all against all. Mm -hmm. and well, the that's Tiamat, for state. sure. Oh, right. absolutely. No, well, let me just tie the in. The Leviathan is actually a symbol of Tiamat. But let me tie in what Stephen said earlier struck me deeply. Here you have this totality of Egypt and only a higher, stronger, greater totality can answer it. You said something like that. Now, that will be the future of humanity as we get more totalitarian. Well, it's so interesting And this is here. why monotheism, properly understood, will be the only thing able to stand against the world of Xi Jinping and so on. Well, it's so interesting, too, that the monotheism here in this particular story, which is partly why we're concentrating on this story, it's a monotheism in the service of those who wrestle with God being, being necessarily free on ethical grounds from tyranny. And so the monotheism is in service of that freedom from tyranny, properly understood, and that's partly what makes it not a tyrannical monotheism in, in and of itself. I wouldn't say monotheism in the service. Then you well, get to the celestial butler almost. Oh, well, I'm, I'm so, kidding okay, you. Oh, okay. but, well, all right, all right. So, so then but more than... In other words... That reveals itself in that is a better way to say it. Yes, you have that's it here. Right. That's right. It's an outrage for a human made in his image to dominate any other human made in his image. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. freedom is an essential of mm -hmm. that vision of God. Right. Well, that's quite, the, that's quite the vision of a unifying totality. It's not a tyrant. Absolutely. It's the thing that... that but not monotheism in the service of anything. Right. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm kidding spoke, you. No, no. I spoke, <laughs> I spoke improperly. It's... It's because God enables, is that which calls you to the freedom. Enables. And there you go, and enables, upon it. reveals itself in. Right. Yeah. Right. By right. the way, D Douglas mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, oh, no, oh, it's a quickie. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Elohim is, is the, the, the Torah word, biblical word for God, the universal God, yeah. Jehovah, of course, the, the, the way the Israelites would know him. Uh, and, and it's in the plural, and, and, and many people know this. But it's very important in this this a lot of people don't know every time elohim is used uh in the bible it is with a singular verb hebrew has singular and plural verbs so mm. just know that there is mm. never a a a any hint that elohim that god the god of of the creation which is genesis 1 1 is elohim it is any it's bereshit bara in the beginning bara is created in the singular it's not baru they created it's bara created singular despite the so fact that the name is plural it's just like the word fish fish is singular and plural but so you could say i, I have a fish and his name is jerry right <laughs> right right but right. Uh, i have fish and their names are but if you only have fish with the singular the fact that it is even a plural term is irrelevant I think it's a plural term because it was the way of saying this God encompasses all that is godly and all gods. That's my own theory. I have no idea that that is true, but just important to know there's no compromise. In, there's compromises with monotheism on the part of the Jews in the Bible regularly, but not on the part of the Torah. One one thing, I know we're not going to read through these uh, genealogies here at the end of chapter six, uh, <laughs> and these are the names of, and the sons of, and the sons of, but I do want to make a point about them just quickly, because, um, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, about the unity 
and its relation to the particulars. And you might say, you know, one of the challenges of life is how do you interpret the chaos of experience, right? And Jordan, you've talked about this a lot, how narrative is a way of fixing the endless multiplicity of, you know, the, the, the being itself into a way that we can interpret it and understand ourselves. And memory is necessary to narrative, right? Because you, if, if you don't have any history, you, you have nothing with which to inter interpret the world. You don't have any knowledge, couldn't even recognize yourself in the mirror without, you know, a memory of nothing what you look like. Together nothing without. holds together at all. And so one of the things I think is so interesting with this genealogy, right, is that what it's, what it's doing right here is giving us the, the genealogy of Aaron and Moses. It, it really ends like they're born of these people who were born of these and these. And it actually turns out that, that if you look, do the math here, that, you know, Aaron and Moses, who are brothers, very interestingly, you know, there's something like the great grandsons of Levi himself. And of course, Levi is one of the 12 sons of, of Jacob or Israel. And you know, of course, he is the grandson of Abraham himself. And so what you have in this is being established actually quite economically. A historical sounds long, continuity. A historical continuity continuity that takes Abraham, sorry, Aaron and, and Moses all the way back, it's only a few generations, to Abraham himself and God's covenant. And so at some level, what, what I think this book is creating in that section, but which it is doing at a larger level in Exodus itself, is creating a kind of history, but you could call it a, maybe a kind of memory of redemption, a, a, a narrative frame within which, you know, it stabilizes so that we can hear and understand and indeed Linking enter into the story. The ancestral world. Could I add to that? The, what I learned from the Jews above all, Dennis, is, you know, Rabbi Sachs, for example, says, if you have any project that lasts more than a single generation, you need schools and you need history. Otherwise, you don't have transmission. And that's incredibly practical today. America used to have public education in the public school. Collapsed. The American Republic is literally suicidal. The transmission's broken down. Yeah, well, when you can't trust the agents of the state with your children, that's an indication of the breakdown of trust in the most fundamental way. Yeah, and but the very story about America right. was thrown out. With right, right. Well, right. you need uniting right. stories, that's clearly, exactly because right. otherwise we're not united. That's that's how it goes. And if we're not united, then we fight. Well, the, united, the united story given today is actually suicidal. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're united in an awful past. Yeah, yeah we're, this, that's right. We're united in our guilt and nihilism. Yes, yes. And this is not linked to monotheism because, I mean, there's... A, there's a narrative, as it were, a counter-narrative to monotheism, which links monotheism directly to violence. Right? That, and and this, you find this in, in the Enlightenment, you find it quite recently. Yeah. There's a distinguished German uh, uh, Egyptologist, actually called Jan Asman, who uh, quite explicitly links monotheism to exclusionary violence. Right? And so, of course, the thought is yeah. polytheistic societies they are much more tolerant, right? Because of course, yeah, yeah, but this is... Well, it's, it, to, me, to, to me, it seems that, that the insistence at the moment is something like this, that the central animating spirit, certainly of the West, is Satan himself. I mean, that's what, it, I really mean that. That's what it looks like. It's like, well, it's all tyranny and power. And it's all hell that we've produced. And there's nothing but oppression. It's like, well, who do you think's in charge here? Exactly. What case are you making here? And that's, that's the case that seems to be being made to me. I think at least it's the spirit of Cain. The accusation is the spirit of Cain's has been in charge all along. And all your protestations to the contrary are merely rationalizations on your part for your fundamental drive to power and oppression. And that's like, the servitude ooh. we need to be let out of. Right, right. Well, of course, of course. And maybe the whole bloody thing should be brought down because of it. I mean, that's the claim. That's, that's certainly... Is that not the Marxist claim? As far as I can tell, and everything that exists that the, should be destroyed. With the postmodern notion the that there's no police. unifying grand narrative, it's like, well, what I mean is that that's that's that claim is precisely we are living under the slavery of that claim. That is our Egypt. That claim, mm -hmm. out of which we need to be liberated. Absolutely. And find our story and find mm -hmm. the story well, that connects us together. Yes. Well, hopefully we have that's a great we're story. That's the Re irony. Returning to the story. source. That's the idea, right? To revivify the dead father. And so that's hopefully what we're doing, at least for us, in, in this Exodus exploration. Maybe, maybe this is a good place to stop, eh? Because we're starting a new chapter, and that was a good closing discussion. And 
we've gone a bit over time today, so perfect. So thank you all, gentlemen, you, much appreciated. And to the camera crew again, to all of those of you who are watching and listening, we definitely appreciate your time and attention and your what participation in what we hope is a journey forward and upward. Part of the reason that the first biblical series I did was serious was because I approached the text as if it might have something to teach me. Well, the practice of this right now, part of what, like you were talking about, Dennis, earlier, that everything's a miracle, the birth of an ant is a miracle, like us being or having this discussion. We're increasingly in a culture where our engagement with things is so bifurcated. We're not allowed to even engage with the full perspective of, of the other side. When the 10 plagues are listed at the Passover Seder, the, the Jew puts the pinky into the cup of wine. We drink four cups of wine. Those who can handle it, I can't. And, and you, you remove some wine with each plague as your way of saying, I'm not going to increase, but decrease my happiness over their suffering.